Okay. Okay, thank you. So again, welcome, buongiorno. So we are here for the uh, third edition of the Mediterranean Symposium on Marine Vegetation, Coral Legion's Dark Habitat and Non-Indigenous Species. This, this third edition is organized in, uh, thanks to the Italian Ministry of Environment, ISPRA, uh, the University of Genova and its department, DISTAV. So without further delay, I would uh, call Professor uh, Laura Canese, Vice Director of DSTAP, to uh, give him, uh, her a welcome speech. Thank you. Morning, everybody. I don't know my speech is on. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm just here to welcome you all to this symposium uh, on behalf of the director of our department, which is the, the Department of Earth, Environment and Life Science. As you can understand, it is a large uh, multidisciplinary de department, and we are, all of us are very much involved in research and uh, uh, teaching activity on uh, uh, the environment and in particular on the marine environment. Uh, we are also involved uh, in the national uh, plan for biodiversity, focused on marine diversity, especially. And also we participate in the Sea Center of the University of Genoa, which brings together all researchers in any discipline who work on the sea. Uh, so why Genoa? Why our department? Because uh, you know that our region is uh, uh, an important region in, in the Mediterranean. Uh, it uh, overlooks completely the sea and uh, is the second uh, largest uh, region for uh, commercial and leisure maritime activities and also uh, for the kilometers of protected coastlines. So I'm very glad to see many colleagues of ours and I also welcome all the representatives of UNEPMA and all the organization who supported this uh, symposium. Uh, I wish that uh, you will enjoy this meeting and uh, will take all the opportunity you have uh, from this uh, symposium. And this is the aim of the Mediterranean Symposium to bring together all the participants, scientists, and uh, people involved in managing the, the sea uh, to protect the sea health also in the face of human activities and also of the uh, global changes. But without much ado, I will uh, leave the stage to more important uh, uh, representatives of this Congress. And I thank you very much. I wish you all a good Congress. Enjoy. Thank you, Professor. The floor is yours, Mr. Khalil. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Mrs. Tatiana Hema, coordinator of the UN Environment Mediterranean Action Plan Barcelona Convention. Dr. Oliviero Montanaro, General Director of the Natural Heritage and the Sea Ministry of uh, Ecological Transition of Italy and MAP Focal Point of Italy. Dr. Um, Professor Laura Canesi, Vice Director of the Department of Earth Sciences, Environment and Life Sciences. Dear participants, dear colleagues. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to our host, Mr. Roberto Cingolani, Minister of Ecological Transition of Italy for granting his support to the Mediterranean Symposia on Marine Vegetation, Coralligenous, Dark Habitats and Non-Indigenous Species. I would like to recognize our partners in this event, the Italian Institute for Environmental Protection and Research, the University of Genova, and it's, excuse me for the pronunciation if I miss uh, the, uh, this, the University of Gen uh, Genoa, and its Department of Earth Sciences, Environment and Life Sciences, and the Italian Society of Marine Biology. Your involvement and an unwavering support for such vital issues has been a key for the success of every endeavor we have been working on together. 
My special, special thanks to Her Excellency Mrs. Leila Shekhawi Mahdawi, Minister of Environment of Tunisia, who uh, will uh, address the participants through a recorded video. Her hectic schedule did not allow her to be among uh, us, but I have no doubt that she, she is fully with us in spirit. My gratitude also goes to our donors, the MAVA Foundation and the European Union. I can personally attest that you have been active contributors to the conservation of the Mediterranean and your generosity has only been surpassed by our passion to our common sea and our environment. I would also like to welcome and thank Mrs. Tatiana Hema, the coordinator of uh, UNAP MAP, Barcelona Convention, for attending personally this event and for contributing to the opening session. I would like to recognize Dr. Oliviero Montanaro, General Director for the Natural Heritage and the Sea in the Ministry of Ecological Transition in, of Italy and MAP Focal Point of Italy. Dr. Montanaro took on his busy time, will actually will take on his busy time and is among us to deliver his message to the symposia participants. Thank you very much, dear friend. Ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, I would like to welcome all of you to this new edition of the Mediterranean Symposium. The very first symposium organized by SPARAC took place in October 2000 in Ajaccio and focused on marine vegetation. For more than two decades, we have been bringing together researchers, uh, renowned scientists and students from all over the region, creating opportunities for all of us, fostering dialogue and information exchanges, exchanges and above all, making the most of our accumulated expertise. For more than two decades, we compiled the recommendations and used them to improve the marine and coastal biodiversity conservation measures, offering viable and applicable options to the Mediterranean countries. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, more than ever, we must recognize the seriousness of the challenges we are facing today. The crisis is three-dimensional. Biodiversity loss, climate change, and pollution cannot be seen as mere problems that might deserve some of uh, some attention. They cannot be addressed only episodically for a photo opportunity or a collective feel good short moment. We are living in a crucial time when the world nations have agreed to protect 30% of the planet by 2030. This target is already enshrined in our uh, recently adopted strategies at the last Barcelona Convention uh, conference of parties held last December in Antalya, Turkey. But we need everyone's commitment and contribution to make it a reality. <laughs> this gathering is also an opportunity for me to salute all the scientists who are participating with us online or physically here in Genova, this very nice city. We are blessed to be joined by a group of students who are embarking with us for the first time on our journey. Your future is the future of our planet and our sea. You are the recipient of knowledge and the guardians of a heritage that we look from our predecessors. We took from our predecessors. At UNAPMAP and SPARAC, we are proud to have supported young scientists over the years. Many of them are now leaders in their field, and we are pleased to call upon them as experts each time we need them. We must have noticed the scientific value and the solidarity of our symposia program. How could we expect less, less when we know the quality, the expertise, and the dedication of our scientific committees? Their contribution was intensive and went beyond our expectations. For the next five days, we will have keynote lectures, sessions to exchange the most reliable scientific work and thrilling roundtable discussions. We will even have 
awards for best posters and best oral presentations. The program is substantial, but I have no doubt that it will be exciting and fulfilling. Thank you very much for being with us and more than anything else, thank you for your contributions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Khalil. Now the floor is yours, Mrs. Zahemma, the UNEP MAP coordinator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Atif. Uh, thank you very much, Atif. You hear me, I guess. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. Oliviero Montanaro, General Director for Nature Heritage and the Sea Ministry of Ecological Transition, Italy, and Mapo Point of Italy, Professor Laura Canesi. Vice Director of Earth Science, Environment, and Life Science Department. So I did it well. Uh, Mr. Kalilatia, Director of UNEP uh, MAP SPARAC. Dear colleagues, you that are present here and the others that are attending us uh, online, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me to be with you today in this important scientific gathering on key Mediterranean habitats and on indigenous species in the beautiful city of Genova. On behalf of the Mediterranean Action Plan of UNEPMAP, as we say, and Barcelona Convention Secretariat, I would like first to express my warmest thanks to Mr. Roberto Cingolani, Minister of Ecological Transition of Italy, for placing this symposium on marine key habitats and on indigenous species under his patronage and for his support to the MAP Barcelona Convention system and its mission towards a healthy Mediterranean sea and coast, which underpin sustainable development. Uh, I would like also to thank very much Madame Leila Shikawi Mahdawi, Minister of Environment of Tunisia, for uh, paying uh, a special attention to the biodiversity uh, uh, protection and conservation Mediterranean in particular for the very direct support given to our center, uh, SPARAC, uh, that is hosted by this uh, contracting party. Dear colleagues, I'm also very pleased because this symposium shows the tradition that we have created already in supporting scientific community on biodiversity matters in the Mediterranean. And this time, this symposium is being held uh, in the framework of uh, two important UN decades. The first one, which has just started, maybe one or two half or two years ago, on the UN decade of ecosystem restoration, which is absolutely very important. And it's also an opportunity for the Mediterranean region to showcase and to benefit from what is going at global level with regard to the conservation of biodiversity. Uh, it is uh, held at a time when the world is ready to commit to 30 by 30 target. Hopefully it will be materialized at the CBD in December in Montreal this year, because we in Mediterranean, we have already taken this important commitment at, la at our last meeting of the contracting parties in Antalya, uh, Turkey, when we committed for these very important targets through two major milestone decision that were taken one on the sabayo and the other one on the policy for marine protected areas so this is why that it's a new momentum that we need all to use and for our own benefit and for the benefit of our region and the other very important uh, element is that we also are aware that this symposium fits very well and is already part of the process of the UN decade on science that is led by UNESCO. Now, I would like to say that uh, biodiversity has been one of the most important priorities of UNEP map, maybe not from the very beginning of its life, but definitely since 82, when the protocol the first protocol on SPA was adopted, and little by little is taking more and more and more a lot of uh, a lot of attention. And I believe that it's your work of the scientific community of our contracting party that has given this very important place and well deserved in the Mediterranean Action Plan Barcelona Convention. We have a very interesting protocol on 
specially protected areas and biodiversity that was adopted in 1995 with a very important and very innovative provision, even including for the protection of biodiversity in the high seas, something that now is being handled also at the global level. So we've been very innovative and showing the way, maybe why not, in a modest way, to other very important development, either by other regions or at global level. And in this, again, I want to pay tribute to the role that scientific co community with their findings, their work in difficult, sometimes not with the right support that you have done in order to push the agenda forward. From UNEPMAP perspective in Antalya, in December, uh, we decided also on the new midterm strategy of MAP and biodiversity is usually is one of our core businesses of the work, but this time we also put quite a lot of attention how to build and to strengthen a policy uh, uh, science platform. And in this, there is still a lot to do. I believe that we have a great example on how we, in particular in the case of biodiversity, I might say it's a very special added value of the case of biodiversity, on how we can make sure that we can guide policy making and decision making based on scientific evidence. And I think that Mediterranean on this, and in particular your work is very well appreciated. So apart from this, we also have dedicated good resources, uh, not necessarily through our own internal system, it's good, but we've been also very lucky to have a very solid partnership for biodiversity in the Mediterranean and several activities that we undertake in the implementation of our program of work, including a symposium like yours, has been supported by very important partners, either contracting parties themselves, like it is the case that we are handling now this conference together with Italy, but also by important foundation, international organization that pay attention to the uh, uh, work in the Mediterranean biodiversity, and they've been very supportive and wish to continue. And together with Alil, now we are working how to build a resource mobilization strategy to fund the Sabio, which is a very important component on research, monitoring and assessment, and we rely a lot on you on how to support this work. Uh, we are also very pleased that uh, uh, we have also an agreement with Italy, uh, and it is the third in the row, and we expect to continue in the future uh, through a bilateral collaboration with UNEPMAP, and I can reassure you that biodiversity is on the top of the agenda of this bilateral collaboration, and we have many, many activities to be undertaken in this framework. And let me also mention also another uh, regional collaboration mechanism that has been uh, created by a number of Mediterranean countries and some other countries and partners, which is PAMEX. Uh, uh, it's an important that has one axe on biodiversity. There are four axes. Barcelona Convention, the MAP system is well involved in all of them, but we were given the right, uh, the role to lead the biodiversity component, which shows how important it is and what big trust our partners have in the MAP Barcelona Convention system in order to support the effort on the, with regard to the uh, biodiversity and also on scientific, on the scientific uh, uh, matters. So improvement of the scientific knowledge uh, is very important and vital. Uh, so first, research provides knowledge about species, habitats, biology, ecology, and life history. It identifies critical limiting resources and determines the relative importance of threats. This in turn guides appropriate conservation ac actions, which is something that we really need to pay a lot of attention. Second, scientific research focuses attention and public awareness and generate support for conservation from several stakeholders and partners. The improvement of scientific knowledge by research and monitoring is an important objective. As I already mentioned, you have also heard about integrated monitoring and assessment program of UNEPMAP. And this is something that would like very much the scientific community to see how we can further develop and in particular finding the modalities for its full and effective implementation. So the organization of this Mediterranean symposium is the concrete implementation of the above mentioned objectives and priorities since 2000 to bring you together to share your findings, the outcome of your work, and for us to build on the outcome of your work, to raise more awareness so we can have more partners in supporting our own common objectives, and also to try to find 
uh, and to make sure that my Barcelona Convention is an effective decision making and implementation body in support of the efforts of the contracting parties. So my warmest consideration to the members of the scientific committee for their excellent work to make the proceedings available before the symposia, which make them a special Mediterranean scientific event. I would like also to comment the work of SPARAC, my team, MAP team, the it Italian Institute for Environment Protection Research, ISPRA, the University of Genova, and its Department of Earth Science, Environment, and Life Science for the organization of such an event after the COVID uh, outbreak. I would like also to thank all participants, all of you, for your availability to contribute to this important event, to share your knowledge, experience, and best lesson learned. I will attend this conference today, all day, and tomorrow afternoon. Unfortunately, I have a commitment for tomorrow morning, uh, and I cannot be with you, but I'll try to follow you online as much as I could. Uh, tomorrow morning, I'm very much interested also to learn from the work that you do, as far as I can, because I'm not a biodiversity uh, scientist, but I wanted to say that I do have a weak spot for the work that scientists are doing. I know it's not easy, it's difficult, it's hard. Many of you also work on the field and this is not something and it's very much highly appreciated. So dear colleagues, thank you very much for your attendance, for contributing to this important conference. This is an opportunity that we offer to scientific community, a commitment that we have taken since 2000 and will continue also in the future. I wish you an excellent symposium, full of novel and creative ideas for the Mediterranean biodiversity. And we want to make nature our ally, as you have done for all your professional life. And we are committed all to make this biodiversity the quest for a better future. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mrs. Tatiana, for this uh words and for putting the symposia in the right context of the global and regional one. So uh, unfortunately, we don't have with us Dr. Oliviero Montanaro. Uh, he was supposed to be uh, in line. So we will give uh, the, uh, the speech, the video speech of uh, uh, the ministry, Tunisian Ministry of Environment, Madame Leila Shikhawi Mahdeou. Can you put the video, please? So you start it again, I hear you. <laughs> I'm blown it. Tatiana Emma, coordinatrice du PNU, PAM, Convention de Barcelone. Monsieur Khlil Ateya, directeur du Centre d'activité régionale pour les aires spécialement protégées et la diversité biologique. Mesdames et messieurs, signore et signori, je suis très heureuse d'être avec vous aujourd'hui, même de façon virtuelle, grâce à la technologie. Au nom du ministère de l'Environnement tunisien, je souhaite euh, la bienvenue aux experts de tous les pays méditerranéens qui se sont mobilisés pour faire le point sur les données scientifiques les plus récentes relatives aux habitats marins clés et, les, et aux espèces non indigènes et surtout pour proposer de nouvelles propositions et solutions de conservation et d'atténuation de l'impact des espèces exotiques sur la biodiversité marine en mer Méditerranée. Je tiens aussi à remercier le gouvernement italien l'Institut pour l'environnement et la recherche environnementale, l'ISPRA, ainsi que l'Université de Genova, pour leur contribution à l'organisation de cet événement, scientifique très important pour la région. Je remercie également le Centre d'action et le Plan d'action pour la Méditerranée et son Centre d'activité régionale pour les aires spécialement protégées de la biodiversité biologique pour la coordination et l'organisation de ce symposium. Mesdames et Messieurs, les habitats marins constituent des fonctions essentielles pour la faune et la flore marine qui s'y développent et constituent un élément majeur des écosystèmes marins. Ces écosystèmes sont soumis à de très nombreuses pressions et subissent les impacts du changement global, qu'il s'agisse des changements climatiques, de la surexploitation des ressources marines, des pollutions liquides et solides de tout genre, notamment les déchets en plastique, 
de l'introduction d'espèces invasives et autres. Mais comment ces écosystèmes répondent-ils à ces perturbations Comment les activités humaines sont-elles en retour affectées par ces modifications Je suis persuadée que ces nombreuses questions pourront trouver des réponses ou au moins des pistes de solutions dans les travaux de ces symposiums. La reconstitution des espèces essentielles et la restauration des écosystèmes de la planète sont des thèmes importants qui nous donnent l'occasion de réfléchir aux mesures de restauration, à leur impact et à la manière dont nous pouvons et devons soutenir à l'avenir les populations humaines et bien évidemment la nature dans toute sa diversité. Ces dernières années ont été marquées par divers moments politiques cruciaux visant à promouvoir l'action en faveur de la reconstitution des espèces essentielles et la restauration des écosystèmes. Il y a eu les réunions sur le cadre mondial de la biodiversité pour l'après 2020, la conférence des partis sur les changements climatiques et la prochaine qui arrive, la Convention des Nations Unies sur le droit de la mer, la Conférence des Nations Unies sur les océans et Stockholm plus 50 qui a réitéré le principe « One Earth, nous n'avons qu'une seule terre et une seule mer, un seul océan ». Les discussions, les engagements et la mise en œuvre tout au long de la présente année et bien au-delà contribueront certainement à la reconstitution des espèces et des écosystèmes et à l'établissement de multiples cibles et objectifs internationaux que nous appuyons. Ces efforts concordent avec l'ambition et la vision de la décennie des Nations Unies sur la restauration des écosystèmes qui doit se poursuivre jusqu'en 2030. Dans ce cadre, la Tunisie réitère sa solidarité indéfectible avec la communauté internationale pour le soutien de ces grandes causes environnementales à l'échelle planétaire. Elle œuvre pour les placer très haut dans l'agenda, aussi bien au niveau international qu'au niveau national. Je vous souhaite donc d'excellents travaux, riches en idées et engagements, en faveur de la bonne santé de la Mare Nostrum, la mer Méditerranée. Merci de votre attention. Thank you. So uh, before we go into the uh, coffee break, I would like to uh, uh, provide you some logistic information. So for those that have poster uh, for the marine vegetation, they can hang it uh, in the uh, dedicated uh, room. And also we have uh, oral presentation in France. So uh, get your uh, headphone for the uh, translation. Uh, we will resume in... Uh, Uh, 15 minutes, okay? Thank you.
besar kan? Fishing. <laughs> دونك قادي سيحاول يلقى في المشاكل الكل يا جماعة دونك قادي يشوف اون فوا كي لوغا تو ريباري اون فرا ان تيست افون سي سي بعثها
protéger la diversité biologique. Mesdames et messieurs, signore et signori, je suis très heureuse d'être avec vous aujourd'hui, même de façon virtuelle, grâce à la technologie. Au nom du ministère de l'Environnement tunisien, je souhaite euh, la bienvenue aux experts de tous les pays méditerranéens qui se sont mobilisés pour faire le point sur les données scientifiques les plus récentes relatives aux habitats marins clés et, les, et aux espèces non indigènes, et surtout pour proposer de nouvelles propositions et solutions de conservation et d'atténuation de l'impact des espèces exotiques sur la biodiversité marine en mer Méditerranée. Je tiens aussi à remercier le gouvernement italien, l'Institut pour l'environnement et la recherche environnementale, l'ISPRA, ainsi que l'Université de Genève, et pour leur contribution à l'organisation de cet événement et surtout scientifique très important de la région. Je remercie également le Centre d'action et le Plan d'action pour la Méditerranée et son Centre d'activité régional pour les aires spécialement protégées de la biodiversité biologique pour la coordination et l'organisation de ce symposium. Mesdames et Messieurs, les habitats marins constituent des fonctions essentielles pour la faune et la flore marine qui s'y développent et constituent un élément majeur des écosystèmes marins. Ces écosystèmes sont soumis à de très nombreuses pressions et subissent les impacts du changement global. Il s'agit des changements climatiques, de la surexploitation des ressources marines, des pollutions liquides et solides de tout genre, notamment les déchets en plastique, de l'introduction d'espèces invasives et autres. Mais comment ces écosystèmes... Luca, mi senti? Prova, Luca, mi senti? Prova, prova. Mi sentite? Mi sento. Mi sento, Gianni? Sì, con un po' di fruscio. Senti? Sì, però con un po' il... non è proprio nitido l'audio. Sento tipo come se gracchia il microfono. Prova a parlare. Prova, prova, prova. Eh sì, ti sento un po' gracchiante.
Questo. Luca, non ti sento adesso. Luca, mi senti?
Okay, so we will start the uh, Mediterranean Symposium on Marine Vegetation, and we will start with the first session. The first session will be shared by Monica Montefalcone and with my colleague Yassine, the President of Yemen and Rexpa, uh, on uh, mapping and monitoring and associated organisms. Monica, the floor is yours. Thank you. Just Monica, just we have some uh, presentation in French, so you have to get your headphones. Thank you. Hello, do you hear me? Okay, so welcome to everybody. It's a great honor for me today to open uh, uh, this uh, symposia on Mediterranean. Uh, uh, habitats and lists, and in particular to open the seventh Mediterranean Symposium on Marine Vegetation, uh, which is uh, among all uh, the, the one with the longest uh, tradition. So we are having uh, one and a half days uh, of uh, communications and posters uh, organized in two distinct uh, sessions. The first session in the morning, uh, mapping and monitoring uh, and associated organism. And in the afternoon, we are going to have uh, uh, in the second session on impacts and disturbances threatening key habitats formation, including global changes. Uh, in the afternoon, we are going to have the uh, poster presentation late in the afternoon. And uh, tomorrow morning, we are handing and closing the Vegetation Symposium, uh, Marine Vegetation Symposium with the round table on uh, needs and expectation to reinforce protection and restoration and conservation. So just a couple of uh, uh, technical remarks because uh, we are already running out of time. We have uh, all of us, all the presenters must be uh, must respect the 10 minutes of the speech. So I'm already here with a timer to uh, notify the presenter when uh, there are two minutes left. So they are able to approach uh, to the end. Uh, I don't wanna take more time. Let me introduce uh, our first speaker, keynote speaker, uh, Professor Gerard Perjan, please. <laughs> It's a pleasure for us to have you opening this important uh, symposium. Uh, Professor Perjan is uh, presenting a keynote speech uh, on Posidonia Oceanica Midov, a major carbon sink in the Mediterranean Sea. So, Gerard, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Monica. It's a really a pleasure to be with you today. I will make my speech in, in French, but all the slides are English. It's a possible for it's a mixed presentation. Then, aujourd'hui, je voudrais vous présenter un petit peu un état de l'art, tout au moins un état des connaissances sur le problème des, du carbone bleu par rapport à la végétation côtière et aux herbiers en particulier parce que c'est un sujet qui fait un petit peu polémique dans le monde scientifique, mais c'est un sujet qui est repris de façon très importante par les décideurs par rapport à l'atténuation du changement climatique. Pour replacer un petit peu cette présentation dans son contexte, je dirais que les le, le de carbone ont commencé à vraiment apparaître sur la scène publique avec l'accord de Paris même si depuis très longtemps, les scientifiques travaillaient dessus. Mais au niveau du grand public, on a découvert lors de la Porte de Paris le rôle de ces puits de carbone et notamment un certain nombre de décisions pour essayer de les conserver, voire de les renforcer dans la mesure du possible. Et par la suite, il y a eu toute une série de décisions politiques 
pour essayer de conserver ces puits de carbone. Alors, au niveau national, par exemple, en France, on a eu la stratégie nationale bas carbone, dont l'objectif était de ne pas émettre plus de gaz à effet de serre que l'on est capable de les absorber. Ensuite, en 2020, la Commission européenne qui a demandé pour 2030 une réduction de 55 des émissions de gaz à effet de serre. Mais quand on parle de, de réduction des gaz à effet de serre, c'est un bilan entre les émissions et les fixations. -dire, si on fixe plus, on, a moins, on, peut toujours, on peut émettre un peu plus. Euh, enfin, la COP26, même si ça n'a pas été une COP fantastique, a quand même ancré, je dirais, les océans dans le combat vis-à-vis -vis du changement climatique. Et surtout, pour nous, au niveau national, le message de l'importance de cette végétation marine est arrivé au plus haut sommet de l'État, puisque lors du One Planet Summit for Ocean, on a eu notre président qui n'a pas hésité à dire qu'il fallait absolument préserver la végétation marine et qu'il allait essayer de créer une coalition pour le carbone bleu. Donc, on pourrait dire que le message est passé. Maintenant, on va voir comment ça se traduit au niveau des faits. Pour faire un petit peu un résumé de ce qu'on entend par carbone bleu et l'importance du carbone bleu, je dirais que la fixation du carbone au niveau de la planète, au niveau de la biosphère, se fait à peu près à égale partie entre les océans et les terres émergées. On estime que 55 du carbone qui est fixé l'est par les océans, à travers bien sûr le phytoplancton, compte tenu des surfaces immenses bien sûr de l'océan, mais également par la végétation marine. 18 du CO2 fixé par la végétation marine, c'est quand même quelque chose d'important quand on sait que la surface de la végétation marine, c'est moins de 0,5 de la planète. Donc, très petite surface, mais grosse fixation. Mais au-delà de la fixation, ce qui est encore plus important, c'est la séquestration. On estime que les stocks de carbone bleu dans les océans, c'est 50 qui est sous, dans les sols qui dépendent de la végétation marine, c'est-à-dire végétation marine, les mangroves, donc les forêts littorales, les, les prés salés, et également, bien sûr, les herbiers de manolophytes marines. Ces trois écosystèmes jouent un rôle majeur donc, dans la, le stockage du carbone au milieu océanique. Si l'on compare un petit peu ces chiffres avec un écosystème qui est beaucoup plus étudié, qui a été valorisé depuis de nombreuses décennies, qui est la forêt, on se rend compte qu'en termes de fixation, les herbiers de manéophytes marines fixent autant de carbone, dont d'équivalent CO2, que les forêts. Ce qui est quand même quelque chose de relativement intéressant. Alors, de temps en temps, je vais vous parler de carbone et je vais vous parler d'équivalent CO2. Tout simplement parce que quand on fixe un gramme de carbone, ça correspond à avoir fixé 3,7 grammes de CO2. C'est la conversion du poids entre les deux molécules. Après la fixation, on a vu qu'elle était équivalente entre les écosystèmes forestiers et les herbiers. Ce qui est intéressant, c'est de voir la partie de ce carbone qui a été fixé, qu'est-ce qu'il va devenir Et où c'est très intéressant, c'est qu'il va être fixé, bien sûr, dans le sol des forêts et dans le sol des herbiers. Mais par contre, dans le sol des herbiers, il va être fixé de façon beaucoup plus importante. On estime que 20 à 25 du carbone qui va être fixé par la plante va être piégé et va être, en, je dirais, séquestré sous l'herbier. Et d'ailleurs, on trouve sur certains herbiers, notamment les herbiers de Posidonie, on va y revenir, des épaisseurs moyennes de maths de 2,50 m, qui sont du carbone en grande partie, tout le moins qui ont des grosses proportions de carbone, qui ont plusieurs milliers d'années. Comparé aux forêts pour lesquelles ça va se faire sur quelques dizaines de centimètres, le sol forestier. Si on regarde les stocks, c'est encore plus flagrant. Un stock de forêt, c'est entre 150 et 400 tonnes d'équivalent CO2 par hectare. Si on prend un sol d'herbier de Posidonie, on est entre 2500 et 3000 tonnes d'équivalent CO2 par hectare. Donc, on a 8 à 10 fois plus de carbone sous les herbiers que sous les forêts. 
Et le but, ça va être de préserver ce carbone, éviter qu'il reparte dans le milieu. Et pour ça, l'avantage des herbiers, c'est qu'ils ne craignent pas trop les incendies, contrairement aux forêts, pas trop la déforestation. Par contre, il peut être impacté par l'ancrage des navires, par exemple. Et enfin, si on regarde la répartition de ce carbone, on voit que dans les forêts, vous allez avoir la moitié du carbone qui va se situer dans le sol et l'autre moitié dans la biomasse. Pour les herbiers, c'est différent. Vous avez une toute petite partie qui est dans la biomasse et l'essentiel de ce carbone est dans le sol et dans la matte, qui est donc ce qu'il faut préserver absolument. Si on regarde un article récent de l'UCN sur le, le stockage du carbone, on se rend compte que bah, vous avez tous les écosystèmes forestiers qui ont, oh, pardon, on va y revenir, bah, les écosystèmes forestiers qui ont des proportions à peu près égales, on a vu, entre la biomasse et le carbone fixé dans le sol. Et quand on regarde les autres écosystèmes, on se rend compte que c'est les herbiers, et notamment l'herbier de Posidonie, qui va représenter les plus grandes quantités de carbone à ce niveau-là. Beaucoup plus que les estuaires ou les mangroves, mais également beaucoup plus que les pitlands, hein, c'est-à-dire les tourbières. Au niveau de, du travail qui a été mené depuis une dizaine d'années, même je dirais presque une vingtaine d'années, puisqu'on a eu beaucoup d'interactions avec le SPARAC, justement sur les inventaires de ces herbiers à l'échelle de la Méditerranée, on a réussi à estimer à peu près les surfaces de ces écosystèmes à carbone bleu, notamment les herbiers de Posidonie. Vous voyez que dans les dernières publications, on est à peu près à 2 millions, entre 2 millions et 2 millions 300 000 euh, je dirais, pardon, je vous l'affiche comme ça vient, millions d'hectares d'herbiers à l'échelle de la Méditerranée. Et ce sont des publications récentes, hein, donc notamment celle de Dimos en 2022, avec des méthodes différentes. Et vous voyez qu'on arrive à peu près au même résultat. Donc, on peut partir sur ce chiffre de 2 millions d'hectares, ce qui est énorme à l'échelle du bassin méditerranéen. Si on regarde de façon un peu plus intéressée, habitant dans une île, ce qui se passe dans les grandes îles méditerranéennes, les six plus grandes îles méditerranéennes, on se rend compte que là aussi, les proportions d'herbiers sont très importantes, puisqu'on est à peu près à, je dirais, 38% entre 0 et 40 mètres de profondeur, avec les îles du bassin occidental, qui vont être beaucoup plus occupées, si je peux dire, vont présenter beaucoup plus d'herbiers, puisqu'entre 0 et 40 mètres, c'est entre 50 et 60 de recouvrement d'herbiers. Et au fur et à mesure que l'on se décale vers l'est, pour des raisons, je dirais, d'oligotrophie de l'eau, de température, on pense également de baisse de salinité, d'augmentation de salinité, on peut se retrouver avec des valeurs plus faibles, descendre à Chypre vers 17 Mais uniquement pour ces six îles méditerranéennes, on a pratiquement 20 des herbiers de la Méditerranée qui sont représentés. Si je vous présente un petit modèle, alors c'est pas très compliqué, hein, c'est un modèle conceptuel, les scientifiques aiment bien jouer avec les modèles conceptuels, simplement c'est pour vous montrer de façon graphique comment ça se passe. Vous allez avoir la fixation du carbone, c'est ce qu'on appelle du carbone organique, il y a à constituer les feuilles, les racines, les rhizomes, etc., qui vont être pris par la plante et qui vont être, on a vu, séquestrés à l'intérieur de, de la matte, c'est-à-dire sous l'herbier de Posidonie. Et on considère pratiquement que les herbiers de Posidonie sont des éponges à carbone parce qu'ils vont récupérer ce carbone et ils vont le stocker dessous. Donc, c'est ce qu'on va essentiellement voir dans le cadre de cette présentation, comment ça fonctionne, ces flux de carbone dans les herbiers. Mais il ne faut pas oublier l'aspect qui est un petit peu à droite, c'est l'aspect calcification. C'est-à-dire que les herbiers vont, avoir, vont abriter toute une faune, une flore, qui vont assurer une certaine calcification. Et malheureusement, si je peux dire, la calcification, ce n'est pas un puits de carbone, ce n'est pas une fixation de carbone, mais ça peut être une source de carbone. On considère que chaque fois que vous allez avoir un gramme de coquille, par exemple de foraminifère ou d'algues calcaires, ça va correspondre à 0,6 g de CO2 qui va être renvoyé, émis dans le milieu. Donc, il faut faire un peu la balance entre ces deux aspects, l'aspect fixation et l'aspect émission. 
Si on regarde la fixation donc, de carbone organique, on a actuellement beaucoup de données en Méditerranée. On a plus de 100 publications qui ont mesuré cette fixation et on se rend compte que la fixation, c'est de l'ordre de 1,3 tonnes de carbone par hectare et par an, ce qui, à l'échelle de la Méditerranée, avec ses 2 millions d'hectares, appro approche pratiquement les 10 millions de tonnes d'équivalent CO2 par an qui vont être fixées dans le bassin méditerranéen. Donc, chaque année, les herbiers de Posidonie fixent 10 millions de tonnes d'équivalent CO2 à l'échelle du bassin méditerranéen. Alors, qu'est-ce que ça représente, ces 10 millions de tonnes Pour vous donner quelques exemples, je vous ai mis des pays, des îles méditerranéennes, avec, dans la première colonne, les surfaces d'herbiers, la deuxième colonne, la capacité de fixation de ces herbiers, ensuite, les émissions et le pourcentage entre fixation et émission. Si on prend des pays comme la France, par exemple, qui va avoir euh, une surface herbier qui est relativement euh, limitée, on va dire modérée, et qui a par contre des émissions très importantes, vous voyez que la fixation du carbone est relativement faible par rapport à les, aux émissions, ça fixe, ça fixe 0,12% de nos émissions, ce qui n'est pas très important. Si on prend un autre pays, par exemple, alors il y aurait la Croatie, je pourrais en parler aussi, avec beaucoup d'herbiers de, et des faibles émissions, vous voyez, on passe à 5,6%, ça commence à ne pas être négligeable au niveau des bilans nationaux, mais si on prend la Tunisie, au hasard, euh, la Tunisie, avec des, une très grosse surface d'herbiers de Posidonie et des faibles émissions, on arrive à avoir plus de 13% des émissions de CO2 qui sont fixées dans ces herbiers. Et vous voyez que pour les îles, c'est aussi des valeurs importantes. En Corse, on arrive à plus de 14 de fixation de nos émissions. À l'échelle de la Méditerranée, si on prend l'ensemble des pays, on est aux environs de 1 de carbone fixé par rapport aux émissions, ce qui n'est pas négligeable quand on connaît le coût des, pro des projets de, ré de réduction des émissions. Pour les îles méditerranéennes, c'est 3 ce qui est encore plus intéressant. Voilà pour la fixation. La séquestration, je vous avais dit que c'était à peu près 20 à 25 de ce qui était fixé. Si on prend une posidonie, ben vous avez à la mort des feuilles le limbe, c'est la partie chlorophyllienne qui va partir, mais tout le reste, c'est les écailles, les rhizomes, enfin la base des feuilles, les rhizomes et les racines vont rester dans cette fameuse mate et justement, ça va produire une certaine séquestration de carbone. Si on regarde, c'est pour à l'ensemble de la Méditerranée, 21 Tout à l'heure, je vous avais dit entre 20 et 25, ça dépend des sites. Hein, mais en moyenne, on est à plus de 21 de carbone fixé qui est piégé et qui va être stocké sous ces herbiers. Pourquoi Parce qu'on a cette structure exceptionnelle qu'on appelle la matte. C'est le seul herbier marin qui a une telle structure. Il y a d'autres plantes qui font des, des mattes, mais elles font 20-30 cm d'épaisseur. En Méditerranée, ben les, les mats, c'est en moyenne 2,50 m d'épaisseur, donc c'est énorme, 2,50 m d'épaisseur avec des, des maximums qui peuvent atteindre, vous voyez, 9 mètres, là c'est le long du littoral de la Corse. Je crois que c'est en Croatie ou en Albanie, on a mesuré jusqu'à 14 mètres d'épaisseur sur certaines mats, donc c'est quelque chose, c'est vraiment une structure bioconstruite unique qui peut d'ailleurs être comparée dans certains cas aux récifs coralliens. On a essayé de, de travailler justement sur cette répartition de ces maths. Là, ce que vous voyez, c'est des mesures qui ont été faites par Sismic Réflexion, qui est un moyen d'investigation très rapide pour estimer les, ces épaisseurs de maths. Alors, c'est différents outils qui ont été utilisés. Bien sûr, on a fait des, des validations sur le terrain pour bien calibrer ce type d'expérience. De, Et là, vous voyez, sur une centaine de kilomètres de côte, vous avez l'épaisseur de maths sur entre 0 et 40 mètres de profondeur. On peut comme ça avoir les épaisseurs sur des très grandes surfaces à l'échelle de la Méditerranée. Alors, comment on fait Je vais vous montrer ensuite pour essayer de voir leur composition. Parce que leur épaisseur, on a vu avec la sismique réflexion, c'est très simple. Par contre, ce qui est quand même intéressant, c'est de savoir combien il va y avoir de carbone dans ces maths. Alors, pour ça, on utilise un outil. J'essaie de récupérer la souris. Voilà. Non, ce pas le vent. Voilà. On utilise un carottier à la gravité. C'est un carottier sur lequel vous allez avoir une tonne de poids dessus. On va le descendre à proximité de l'herbier et on va le lâcher sur l'herbier. Vous allez voir, ça rentre, comme on dit en France, comme dans du beurre. 
Hein, c'est instantané. Ensuite, on remonte des carottes de mat. Vous allez voir ici. On lâche le carottier. Voilà. Et avec ça, on a récupéré sur cette centaine de kilomètres que je vous présentais tout à l'heure, 40 carottes en, qui faisaient entre 50 cm et 3 mètres, 3,50 mètres d'épaisseur. Ça a permis comme ça de mesurer déjà l'âge de ces carottes. Et on s'est rendu compte qu'en moyenne, ces herbiers avaient 4000 ans en termes d'âge. Donc, c'est des herbiers qui sont installés depuis très longtemps le long du littoral. Le, ces, ces carottes que vous voyez sur cette figure ont été découpées en tronçons pour analyser régulièrement le carbone de la surface jusqu'à la base de la carotte. En matière organique, on a trouvé donc l'équivalent sur ces 2,50 mètres de carottes de plus de 700 tonnes de carbone organique par hectare. Mais on a également mesuré le carbone inorganique dont je vous parlais tout à l'heure, la calcification, qui est de l'ordre de 600 tonnes. L'objectif, ça a été de faire un bilan entre le carbone organique, je vous rappelle les, les, le puits de carbone, et le carbone inorganique, qui est cette fois-ci les émissions de carbone. Et quand on regarde ce qui se passe, on se rend compte sur que sur nos 100 km de côte, on a quand même un bilan net qui est tout à fait positif en fonction du puits, puisque ce que vous voyez sur la figure en vert, c'est toutes les zones de puits, c'est-à-dire plus de carbone qui est enfoui que du carbone qui est émis, et le, pour les herbiers profonds, on a un peu plus de carbone émis du fait d'une plus forte calcification. Donc, c'est clair qu'en Méditerranée, il y a eu beaucoup d'articles polémiques un peu sur le sujet. On a des résultats qui permettent de montrer que les herbiers de Posidonie sont vraiment des puits de carbone et en aucun cas des sources de carbone. Pour finir, je voudrais vous laisser peut-être cinq messages à garder de cette présentation et surtout à garder des puits de carbone. La première, je dirais, elle est connue depuis longtemps, elle est évidente, les résultats vont tous dans ce sens, c'est que les herbiers de Posidonie vont fixer et surtout vont stocker des très grandes quantités de carbone dans la mat. La deuxième, c'est que les herbiers de Posidonie, et là on en a la preuve sur plus de 100 km de côte, mais également sur d'autres stations qui sont en cours de je dirais d'investigation, enfin, constitue un puits net pour la fixation du CO2. Il n'y a pas d'émission, le bilan il est sans conteste positif, c'est un puits. Le troisième point, et c'est un point à mon avis essentiel, c'est la conservation. Et si on veut essayer de conserver ces stocks de carbone et surtout éviter qu'ils soient remis dans le milieu sous forme de CO2, ou sous forme de méthane, ce qui sera encore pire, il faut absolument les conserver, et c'est actuellement la meilleure stratégie de travailler sur la conservation. Après, vous avez la restauration, on en parle beaucoup, même dans les accords de Paris, de renforcer les puits de carbone. C'est une solution, mais ce n'est pas une solution qui doit être mise en œuvre uniquement pour atténuer le changement climatique, parce que c'est un procédé qui coûte très cher et dont l'intérêt je dirais, doit être utilisé avec précaution si c'est uniquement pour atténuer le changement climatique. Par contre, les herbiers de Posidonie, je dirais, sont des sources de biodiversité, sont des sources, je dirais, au niveau également de, de tous les services écosystémiques qu'ils apportent. Et là, dans ce cas-là, associer la préservation de la biodiversité, la préservation des services écosystémiques, y compris la réduction des changements climatiques, là, c'est quelque chose de très important et qu'il faut envisager. Je vous parlais tout à l'heure des publications. Il y a eu des publications récentes, le rapport de l'UICN en 2021 sur, justement, qui fait un bilan sur, là aussi, les connaissances, non seulement sur les herbiers, mais sur les prés salés également de, les, de ces puits de carbone en Europe. C'est quelque chose de très, très important. Et un autre article que je vous conseille de lire, c'est justement ce coût par rapport à l'efficacité et l'intérêt de ces puits de carbone et de la, de la restauration. C'est pour ça que je vous parlais tout à l'heure de conservation qui semble être la meilleure solution. Voilà, je vous remercie pour votre attention et s'il y a des questions, ça sera avec les yeux. Thank you, Gérard, for this very, very interesting presentation. I think that all of us are, are well aware about the important, ecological importance of uh, 
secret middle, but I think that the numbers and the results that you showed us are really huge and impressive. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, is there any question? Thank you very much for your uh, presentation, but I have one only comment on the distribution of Barcelona in the Mediterranean. Uh, I found in table that there is no any data about the distribution of Barcelona in Egypt, but we have a lot of publications uh, with one of them with uh, several protected areas. It is financed by IOCN. We have uh, specific and great work on the Barcelona. And now last year we have uh, a publication on the Pseudonia uh, distribution around the whole Egyptian trade cost. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. I just I I it was, yeah. Uh, yeah. I just show some synthesis, but if you have data, I profit that you are all together. Uh, if you have data concerning the inventory of Posidonia Meadow and Seagrass Meadow in general point of view, I, I will be very pleased if you can give me the, the information to continue the, the synthesis. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation, nice presentation, but um, I have some questions. Uh, what about the other uh, class species like Simitos uh, and Because this species is um, uh, grow together in, uh, in the same area, for example, in the uh, South Mediterranean Sea. And uh, second, uh, how to apply this study in all the Mediterranean uh, Sea? And I don't think we need to protect this, um, uh, this grasses because we know, all, we know that this species now it's treated by climate change and uh, the human activities. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, of course. I've presented the main result concerning Posidonia because it's a species where uh, we have a maximum of data. But actually, several teams are working on Simodosa and Nodosa because it's very interesting people, uh, people, very interesting species because uh, this species uh, grows with, uh, in warm area. And actually, with climate change, this species is growing in the mid and sea. And uh, but the, the difference with Posidonia is that Simodosa doesn't build a mat. For Posidonia, you have a mat that can reach several meters high. It's not the case of Simodosia, but you have also organic matter in the soil under the meadow of Simodosa and Doza, and these uh, values are not negligible. And I think it's other. Uh, organic matter that we have to take into account for the general uh, synthesis for the median sea, of course. Okay, I have a more geological question. Uh, you have mentioned the oldest uh, map you, you discovered is 4,000 years old. Are they everywhere the same? Have you older and younger? And if you can to put it in geological context, that means why they started and how old they are here yeah. really. Yes, uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, for for the, the data that we have actually, is that uh, the oldest mat reach 9,000 9, years old. It's very old. But the, the mean age, because the mat, you have a phenomena of erosion, accretion, and so on, the mean value is around 4,000. But uh, it can reach more than than. I'm sorry, but I need to stop the questions because we are really out of time. We can discuss later with you. So thank you once again. Let's open the first session. The session one on mapping and monitoring with associated organism. Uh, Miss uh, Julie Deter. Yeah, she's going to present us a speech, the title of Participative Mapping and Aerial Photographs Helps to Show the Strong Decline of known as the still Northern Eastern Posidonia Oceanica Seagrass Bed from French Occitane region. 
Julie, the floor is yours. Thank you. So uh, I'm Julie Deter. I'm going to present you a, a work of uh, from several of my students, and uh, I will show you uh, how we use the participative mapping and aerial photographs to to show the strong decline of Posidonia seagrass beds in uh, French Occitanie. So I think that uh, we are all. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, no. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we all agree here that uh, knowing the baseline of an ecosystem is very important. And and for example, here with this paper, you can see the the trend of several species. And uh, it depends on Europe, and you can see that depending on the localities, we have a, a decline or decline or increase. For example, for Posidonia Oceanica, it's uh, the main uh, trend is uh, no change, but uh, we still have uh, one third of decline. And for this paper, uh, it's important to have uh, all data. Uh, here you can see that in uh, no. 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 This region is uh, on the on the west part of the uh, Mediterranean French coastline. It is a 225 kilometer coastline influenced by the Rhone River. And uh, this uh, this region is uh, highly artificialized with uh, 17 percent. Uh, this artificialization is a consequence of the Mission Racine. This, uh, this program is a French, uh, an old French program, which boiled uh, between uh, the 1960s and the 1980s, six tourist units, um, almost from uh, Virgin uh, Lands. Uh, it was the cause of the highest demographic growth in France between the 1980s and, and now, um, especially for the town like uh, Montpellier, Béziers, Narbonne, and Perpignan. Here is an example of uh, La Grande Motte. Between 1950 and uh, now, we had uh, a lot of sand with uh, very small houses and uh, lagunas. And, uh, and now you can see the, the high buildings. Uh, what, what we know now in uh, this region for uh, Posidonia Oceanica, here uh, you can see in green very small uh, meadows and all around uh, the dead mat in uh, brown. So we have small meadows uh, nowadays. So the objectives of this work was to investigate the baseline for this ecosystem. And for that, we wanted to use a multidisciplinary approach, uh, which combines local ecological knowledge and the analysis of old aerial pictures. Uh, then we quantified the lost areas using a comparison between uh, between the current cover and this old cover, and we estimate also spatial indices from old and current maps. So for the materials, this work was done in uh, between uh, 2018 and uh, 2021. We used the bibliographic synthesis, mainly a paper of uh, Gérard Perjean, which is here. Uh, local ecological knowledge uh, was obtained from a survey with uh, 34 questions. This survey targeted all divers and fishermen 
uh, who were asked to draw on uh, some cards. We use also old aerial photos since uh, 1935 and the current cover map that I showed you just before. For the results, uh, we had 36 responses. Uh, the respondents were between 60 and 91 years old. One was 45, 44, sorry. And uh, what is, what, something uh, it's uh, interesting is that all of these people uh, knew the plant, knew uh, they were able to recognize uh, the plants on photos and to cite uh, interesting words like uh, plant, uh, rhizome, uh, flower, uh, even if uh, some of them uh, uh, believed that it was uh, an algae. But uh, they were also aware of the ecological role of this plant because they cited nursery, oxygenation, food, uh, habitat, uh, refuge, reproduction. So some uh, very interesting uh, words. So it was uh, the first uh, optimistic uh, message. Um, all of them uh, were also concordant between uh, their response. And uh, they confirmed the absence of uh, Posidonia in some unfavorable sites like lagoon outlets, uh, fine sandy bottoms, and uh, some, somewhere where the, the hydrodynamics was too strong. Uh, they also were able to draw uh, the Posidonia seagrass bed. So you can see uh, on these three examples, you have in green the Q1 distribution, um, in uh, blue the distribution according to the survey, so what uh, the people draw, and in uh, red or orange uh, what we, we could uh, um, map with aerial photographs. You can see that the data are complementary and uh, most of the time concordant. And this data uh, showed us that uh, disappearance uh, was effective in uh, many sites. And even in one site, uh, Carnot, it was uh, almost a total, total dis disappearance with 99% uh, of lost. lost. Uh, using these uh, old and current maps, we uh, calculated spatial indices using FRAGSTAT. And uh, for the period uh, 1954 and uh, 2014, and uh, we showed a degradation with an increased uh, fragmentation of the landscape from zero to 63%, a decrease uh, in the number of patches, minus five to minus 64%, a decrease in the average patch area, minus five to minus 96%, a decrease Decrease in the cohesion between patches, uh, which is uh, the distance between the patches, from zero to minus 36%, and an increase in the complexity of patch shapes from zero to 85%. The causes that were cited by uh, people was first uh, coastal development, then trolling, then pollution, and then anchoring. Uh, it is interesting because uh, most of these people were old fishermen so, and old trawlers. So they were able to, 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 told, uh, to tell us that uh, they were uh, responsible of uh, this uh, disappearance with their trawling. To conclude, uh, so first we can say that uh, these surveyed people were able to, to knew Posidonia Oceanica, and were able to cite the, its roles. The, this multi approach was uh, useful and uh, brings uh, complementary data, but uh, that's something to, that we have to do quickly because uh, these people are uh, old, <laughs> they are dying, yes. Um, and uh, we also showed that in the last 70 years, uh, there was a, a strong loss in the, this region with a minimal overall regression of 65%, more than 400 hectares. And this regression was certainly at the origin of important ecological and economic consequences like fish abundance and coastal erosion uh, that we know now in this region. 
So to finish, I thank the founders for, of this study and our partners, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Julie, for the perfect timing. <laughs> Any question? Thank you, Julie. Uh, actually, I have two questions, small ones. The first is a really a technical curiosity. Uh, how do you measure the cohesion between pitches? And the second is uh, you show the situation, if I understood well, to 2040. Now, perhaps uh, you have some sign of stopping the regression of uh, Posidonia Midos. Thank you. Uh, in in this region, the the sign of uh, are encourages. I think it's uh, more or less stable. So uh, I think the dec the decline is uh, stopped. So uh, yeah, we can say that. And uh, so yeah, I have forgotten the first question. How did you the cohesion? Cohesion, yes. It was measured uh, using fractal. Is a, it's a software uh, using maps. Okay. Any other question? And what do you think about anchoring? I mean, uh, trolling has been banned a few years ago, and we also did a study, a similar study at Trinity Islands, and we saw that anchoring was the main disturbing factor. Have you, say, have you seen any, um, any patchy coverage due to anchoring practices, any scars in the middles? So anchoring is really the main factor, the main cause of regression, even in that part of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, yeah, I don't have the, the picture here with me, but uh, this region uh, knows uh, a lot of anchoring, but not so much, not as much as uh, in Corsica or in the east of France. And actually, uh, nowadays, the, the anchoring is on a dead mat and not on a, a live Posidonia because uh, the meadows are very small. But uh, the Natura 2000 sites are working on this uh, problematic and they want to, to put the boys in. Uh, so. Okay, if we don't have any, quest any more questions, we can move to the second communication. Thanks once again. We should have Mr. Thomas Bockel connected online. Are you there? Yes, good morning. Can you? Hello, good morning and welcome. He is presenting a new map of the biodiversity in coastal waters. There is your. Thank you. So I guess you can see my screen correctly? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. So I'm um, a bit sad not to be with you in uh, in Italy today, but uh, last minute uh, family issues made me made it impossible. But still, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. I will present you a work named "A New Map Atlas of Biodiversity in Coastal Waters." This work was realized by the team of uh, Andromeda Oceanology, including uh, Julie Deter, that was the presenter of the of the last presentation and uh, this work was realized uh, in collaboration with the French Water Agency. So I'm doing this presentation uh, because uh, Gwenaëlle de la Ruelle asked me to do it. She was uh, leading this project but she couldn't be available today. So um, the main objectives of this uh, work are to share uh, clear and operational formats in a clear and operational format the results of the monitoring networks performed by Andromeda Oceanology and the French Water Agency on the two main ecosystems 
that are uh, Posidonia oceanica meadows and uh, the coralline genius. If we go more in details, those objectives are to first better qualify the ecological status of Posidonia meadows and coralline genius. Next, to integrate information on ecological functioning in the evaluation of the, the ecological status, refine the identification of priority management areas, and finally, to valorize and share the results of the evaluation and of the monitoring. Uh, the general methodology used for this work was based on more than four. 1,430 biological data points, uh, maps of uh, 11 human pressures, uh, recent data um, with uh, aging less than six years, and uh, we've produced uh, 83 maps, maps in uh, this group. Um, those data uh, are based on a few monitoring networks, so I'll try to be uh, fast in presenting them. First, the RICOR uh, network uh, that is studying the correlate genius mainly based on photographic quadrats. Then the TEMPO uh, network that is um, monitoring Posidonia with many different indicators, such as uh, shoot density, but also uh, telemetry, photogrammetry. Uh, the CALM network that is studying, uh, that is performed by the Chorus Society and that is studying. Uh, sounds, uh, biological sounds, and anthropogenic sounds. The PCS network that is studying the fish populations uh, using uh, environmental DNA since uh, 2020. And the SurfStat network uh, that is mapping the ecosystems and the impact network that is a, a network of, of um, modeling and uh, mapping of the anthropogenic pressures. All those networks and the maps associated are available on the metrics platform online uh, for free. Uh, if we go more in details in, in details in the method for the seagrass meadow, in order to evaluate the final ecological state, uh, we used we first evaluated the, the ecological state using uh, the vitality. Uh, indicators uh, based on many indicators, but uh, some of them were were linked to uh, underwater work. We also used the uh, telemetry, photogrammetry, and the uh, sonar surveys to evaluate the the surface and the, the dynamics of the limits of the meadows. We also evaluated the uh, ecological functioning using sounds and fish diversity data. And finally, we evaluated the level of pressure using the, the models uh, I told you before. Uh, finally, for the meadows, we combined those three indicators and we produced, based on bibliography and the experts' propositions for the weights, we produced a final uh, ecological uh, score uh, in five classes, from uh, very bad in red to very good in blue. This methodology allowed us to obtain this kind of map for every uh, water body in the French Mediterranean. In each map, you can see a synthesis of the main indicators used and the location of the sampling stations. We did the same for the Coralli genius. I will not go into the details, but we used different indicators evaluate uh, the ecological states, such as the, the vitality of the fixed species, the Borgonians, the presence of filamentous algae, um, also sound data, and we also uh, evaluate the level of pressure using the primitive pressure, but also marine traffic data and the fishing uh, maps. And we produced uh, final ecological uh, indicator uh, with five classes again. Obtaining, uh, so for the coral genius also, uh, those kinds of maps for each water body in the French Mediterranean. Uh, as I told you, uh, all those 
those data or those results are available on the metrics platform line. So uh, feel free to, to have a look. And uh, as you can see, the, the, the results are mapped according to the colors of the final ecological state. And also the, the, the raw data are available. Uh, as a synthesis, uh, four take home messages. A good ecological status has been achieved for 74% of the water bodies for Corrigenius and for 61% for Posidonia Meadows. Um, the ecological functioning was considered altered for 84% of the Corrigenius and 71% of the Posidonia Meadows. And uh, the water bodies for which the final general status was good or slightly altered for both habitats are quite rare. And finally, these data allow coastal communities, government services, and users of the sea to better understand and therefore better protect underwater biodiversity. So as I told you, the, the, the main aim of this work was really to, to share this work and to let you know that all the results are available online. And uh, this work was done in 2020, and the same kind of work will be done next year for the surveillance results 2020-2023. Uh, Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you, Thomas. Uh, also to you because of the perfect timing. We have a uh, time for questions. Is there any? Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And just I uh, would like to ask about the title of this uh, lecture uh, Atlas in the Coastal Area, uh, where the lakes and the, and the sea and the oceans is not so clear. For the title of this presentation, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't and didn't hear, hear well the question. Can you repeat, please? Yeah, uh, you said that in the Bibles, the biodiversity in the coastal area, which coastal area? In the sea, in the oceans, and the lakes, and freshwater, and marine water, where? Where okay. in the coastal area? Okay. Yes. The, um... This work was uh, focused on the on the two ecosystems that are the Posidonia meadows and the Coralic genius. And the meadows we so the meadows we worked on were the ones that were mapped by the Surfstat project. So uh, those maps range between zero and eighty meters deep. But the, the meadows are going less deep, obviously. And uh, the study area was the the French Mediterranean, so from Occitanie to the east, and uh, including Corsica. Any other question? So that's all. So thank you once again, Thomas. Thank you. The next presentation by Daniele Ventura, he is here with us. He's presenting a work titled The Three Dimensional Mapping for Fine Scale Cartography of Posidonia Cerca Seagrass Middle Limits with Underwater Structure from Martian Photogrammetry. Session part is never the near you then to that. Yeah. 
Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniele Ventura, and I am a research fellow based in Rome, working at the Department of Environmental Biology and Ecology of the University La Sapienza. So today I would like to show this brief presentation regarding the three-dimensional mapping for fine-scale cartography of Posidonia Oceanica seagrass middle limbs using underwater extraction from motion photogrammetry. Uh, since I care about my safety, I swear to make this presentation very fast. So uh, just some uh, word to introduce the importance of Posidonia Middle. Uh, in fact, I am sure that everyone here in this room knows very well why middles are so important for the stability of marine communities and why the species is protected uh, by different legislation, both on national and international level. However, despite, this, despite uh, these protection policies, an important part of Posidonia middle are declining due to boat anchoring, changes in sedimentation rates, often linked to climate change, and also because of illegal trolling. Uh, these kind of activities are often focused where the middle are more vulnerable, that is along their upper and lower limits, resulting in habitat fragmentation and degradation. Uh, in this context, uh, remote sensing and mapping techniques are key tools uh, to understand the middle dynamics, to detect uh, impacts and define management, management action suitable also for restoration plans. Uh, acoustic methods such as uh, single beam and multi beam echo sounder, as well as size scan sonar and uh, aerial imagery acquired by satellite or airplanes have been largely used to characterize seagrass beds over the last decades. Uh, more recently, uh, new remote sensing techniques based on acoustic telemetry, optical data acquired by unmanned aerial vehicles, better known as drones, and underwater photogrammetry have been used to provide ultra fine mapping of benthic habitats, including Posidonia Mido. So, uh, speaking of underwater photogrammetry, I can start introducing our work. The study were, uh, was carried out uh, on the northwest coast of Gilio Island, near the area affected by the presence of the Costa Concordia cruise ship, which partially sank on 13 January 2012. Uh, even if the wreckage did not directly impact this middle, the activities carried out uh, by other vessels uh, have damaged uh, this area. Uh, as you can see from this map, uh, the area was mapped by, by multi beam echo sound. However, also with this kind of high resolution acoustic data, the lower limits of the middle uh, were not easily detectable. Uh, therefore, our primary need was to find a time effective and maybe a low cost method to, to finally map this area to understand the current status of middle after the, the removal of the wreck and also to follow its recovery after the departure of the, the ship. Uh, let's, see, let's see some of the main steps of our work. Uh, first of all, on the water, HD images were acquired by a consumer grade action camera, that is a GoPro Hero 10, which, despite its small size, has a quite good sensor of about 23 megapixels. The built in time lapse mode was used to shot a photo every two seconds, ensuring an in track overlap of 80%. Uh, for in track overlap, we mean the overlap between consecutive photos, while the cross track overlap is the distance between adjacent transects. Uh, this camera was mounted on a DPV, so a diver propulsion vehicle, to cover a large area and also to keep a, a safer profile during diving activities by reducing the bottom time uh, spent by the diver underwater. Uh, because keeping the correct uh, in-track and, and cross-track overlap, as well as uh, to keep the constant distance from the seedbed, uh, are key points uh, in photogrammetric processing, uh, I suggest to equip the TPV with a spirit level, a compass, and also with a depth gauge, in order to provide an easy way to follow the correct path uh, to the diver. Um, this part uh, usually with drone is easier because uh, we can uh, use a GPS unit and then, and then we can plan outside with our laptop an accurate survey grid. But underwater, uh, of course, we need to find a different solution. 
For imagery processing, we use the Agisoft Metashape, that is a well-known and user-friendly extraction from motion software. Uh, and the main steps imply, imply image alignment after key point detection and filtering, estimation of camera internal parameters, georeferencing and scaling using ground control points coordinates, leading to the generation of a georeferenced sparse point cloud. After that, the densification of the point cloud is, to, is done through multi-view stereo matching algorithms uh, implemented in the um, edges of the meta shape. Uh, finally, a dense point cloud was used to generate a digital surface model, which in turn serves for photo rectification and orthophoto mosaic creation. Uh, in this video, on this rendering, we can see the dense point cloud of the mapped area and the camera's position represented by the small blue frames. Uh, of course, the, the Posidonia is represented by the points in dark green. Um, let's see some of the main results. Uh, so after imagery processing, more than 2,000 images are correct, correct aligned uh, to produce a 40 million dense point cloud. Uh, this point cloud was transformed into a raster grid uh, by inverse weight interpolation to generate a digital surface model with a spatial resolution of 1.3 centimeter per pixel, extending from uh, 5 up to 30 meter depth. Uh, already, this raster product can be used to identify even the smallest and isolated patches of Posidonia Oceanica according to their morphologies. Uh, in a, oops. In addition, by subtracting the digital surface model that included all the bottom feature to a DTM, which is a bare earth ray model, we generated a canopy eight model, a CSN, that removes the influence of bottom morphology on depth while preserving the eight information of only elevated features, such as Posidonia patches. Uh, this is a very and useful way to depict the shape of the middle and also to infer uh, its conservation status, its cell condition. Uh, the orthophoto mosaic also displays an ultra high spatial resolution with 0.5 cm per pixel, which allowed a very fine identification of the lower limits of the middle. Uh, in this way, we can highlight, uh, for instance, intermat channels, sandy patches, and also rocky outcrops. Um, as you can see, uh, the, the, the photographic detail is uh, also very useful uh, to uh, have a good uh, base layer in GIS software to depict, for instance, the Posidonia edges. Uh, however, since the manual classification of this other spatial resolution imagery is a long and often uh, boring operation, we decided to use an object-based image analysis approach to speed up this job. Uh, first of all, we run the segment mean shift tool implemented in ArcMap to reduce the complexity of the image by getting several pixels together into a more complex object uh, based on their spectral similarity. Uh, the segmented image, where, um, on the segmented image, we applied a supporter vector machine classifier. That is a supervised machine learning algorithm, very useful to classify complex data into different classes. Uh, in this way, we could finally map five cover classes, as we can see from this map. So uh, we can tell the difference between rocky substrates, uh, Posidonia meadow, uh, sandy patches, and also by rocks covered by mud or uh, algae. Uh, in conclusion, the major strengths of this method can be summarized as follows, because it is an efficient and long-cost method for fine-scale mapping of seagrass uh, habitats. Uh, in addition, 3D point clouds, mesh model, and raster products can be used for a large variety of GIS applications, where an ultra-high spatial resolution is required to detect even the small changes in the middle. Uh, moreover, uh, it is a powerful tool for data comparison and visualization. So you could use this product also to tell a story to show the, um, the result of a transplantation operation, for instance. Uh, by contrast, uh, as weakness, we could uh, um, remember that this protocol can be mainly applied in areas where the meadows are characterized by low density, such as along the lower limits or where the meadows are fragmented. 
moreover, the uh, image acquisition can be affected by water depth, turbidity, and currents. So perfect C condition become mandatory uh, to get a good result. Uh, in addition, if an accurate georeference products are required, we should also consider the time needed to deploy and acquire a lot number of ground control points on the seabed. Finally, uh, ultra high spatial resolution of cartographic products can be seen also like uh, a witness because in this case, uh, we um, need a very accurate uh, tool to perform accurate classification. Uh, and sometimes the software are not user-friendly, are complex and also expensive. In this case, for instance, I'm referring, I mean, thinking about the Trimble by cognition, uh, that is a powerful tool to uh, perform uh, object image analysis, but it's also very, very expensive. Okay, that's all. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Thank you, Daniele, for this very interesting uh, presentation. Also, showing to show us uh, these uh, modern, I would say, technologies that probably would be the future. I just want to ask you something. You say that one of the main limits is linked with the not possibility to uh, classify maybe the results when the needle is dense, is highly dense and covered. Uh, how can you think we can solve this issue? Because otherwise, uh, it will be only limited to yeah. small portions of the middle. Yeah. Uh, this is another weakness of the, uh, this tool because, uh, yes, the, the density, the shot density is an important measure and uh, it can be done only with divers. With this method, we can measure F the height of the canopy, but the density is not easy because the density of point cloud is not directly. Uh, linked to the density of middle because it depends by the number of photos, uh, the condition of acquisition. So probably is a step uh, to work on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question right there, Julie? Thank you. Uh, yes, maybe you 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 say that, but I, I'm not sure. What was the, the size of your area? It's uh, it's very huge. It's more than. Uh, 100 square meters. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And what was the distance between uh, the seabed and your camera? Uh, from the seabed, uh, we keep a constant inside of four meters because uh, we see that this correct distance also considering the field of view of the camera. Yeah, okay. four meters. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's good uh, <laughs> to perform this kind of target. <laughs> what about cost? The cost uh, is good because the reaction camera is uh, very cheap. Eh? The, the DPV, the driver propulsion vehicle, yes, uh, is not very expensive. Mm, and probably the most expensive part is the software processing because, of course, the software needs a license. Uh, but the software we use, the meta shape, the meta shape, has also an um, educational license. So it is good because it is um, a cheaper, uh, cheaper software to perform photogrammetric processing compared to others. No more questions? Okay. okay, thank, thank you, you so thank much. you. Then. So the next presentation uh, should be online by um, Fabrice Hongnandan. Apologize me, Fabrice, if you are connected for the pronunciation of your name. Are you there, Fabrice? No. Nobody. Fabrice, do you hear us? No? no. Okay. Let's see if we can recover later. Uh, we can move to the next presentation by Patrick Astruc. Patrick? Is it? French category, yeah. Hmm? He's going to present his work titled Involving Managers in the Ecosystem-Based Assessment of Marine Habitats, a case study in French Catalonia. Okay, so I skip with... I think I have the word. 
it doesn't work. No. Just for the right. Just for the right. But it's it's working. Uh, hi everybody. So I'm uh, Patrick Astruc. I work at uh, GIS Possidoni in Marseille. And today I would like to, to share with you an experiment um, in the, the French Catalonia, so in the southern part of the Gulf of Lyon, about the involvement of managers in the ecosystem-based assessment of marine habitats. So this work to, 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 took place in the, um, the frame of the MARA project. So it's a life integrated project headed by the French Office of Biodiversity. And the main uh, objective of this project is to maintain or improve the conservation status of marine habitats of interest. So we are in the frame of the Habitats Directive, Natura 2000. And as a partner, uh, the GIS Posidoni is bringing the ecosystem-based approach, which is one of the pillars of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. And we consider, consider that the ecosystem-based approach provides a method that assess both the functionality and the structure of the habitats, so it fits with the, the purpose of the habitats directive. So to apply the ecosystem-based approach, we are implementing the UBQI, so for ecosystem-based quality index. Uh, in this case study, we will work with the Posidonia oceanica seagrass meadows, infralitoral photophilus reefs, and coralogenous beds. So on the basis of a conceptual model. Uh, no. Showing the, the main compartment, functioning compartment of the ecosystem and the links between them. Um, we have between 10 to 15 descriptors to assess the status of these main compartments and always involving classic assessment, assessment methods like transect, quadrats, photographs, and each function, functional compartment as a weight according to the importance of the, of the compartment in the functioning of the ecosystem. So we have a, a quite simple formula uh, summing the weight and the status of each compartment. And we have a classification with five status, a notation from zero to 10 with five status from bad to very good, quite similar to those from the Water Framework Directive. And always in the Mara project, uh, we have um, we have training we, have, we train MPA managers. So the aim is to improve their field skills and knowledge about ecosystem-based approach and indices, but also to to test and to question the BQI and its application. And uh, and obviously, it's uh, an opportunity to gather actual data that are useful for the the large-scale analysis of the Mara project. So in our case study, two MPAs are involved. Um, first, the Natural Marine Park of the Gulf of Lyon. It's a recent one created in 2011. It's a 400,000 uh, hectares uh, surface area uh, with a sandy coast here, then a rocky, rocky shore uh, until the, the border with Spain. And with uh, seabed from, the, the surf, from uh, zero to up to 1,000 meters. So the other MPA is the Natural Marine Reserve of Cerber Banyuls. Uh, it's an older one created in 1974. Uh, it's a small uh, MPA, only 650 hectares, but including uh, 65 hectares mountain zone here. And this area is surrounded by an intermediate buffer zone where fishing and mooring are regulated. So the training took steps took several steps. Uh, first, a lecture about the ecosystem-based approach and the application of indices, followed by field training during four days. Then the, um, there was an online meeting to present a database for a dat a data entry and the UBQI calculation. And new field training were um, uh, demanded by the managers uh, to work on specific descriptors so during uh, three days, and all these steps were completed by self-training by the managers themselves. So they can be operational for uh, the monitoring implementation. 
So 29 uh, sites were assessed, corresponding to eight Posidonia Oceanica meadows, 10 infralitoral reefs, and 11 coralli genus. And this work involved more than 15 divers from the, from the MPAs. Uh, let's see some results in general. Uh, for the Posidonia Oceanica meadow, we, we have only one good status, which is in the, um, the no-take uh, zone, and uh, one poor status. And the more influencing descriptors, uh, corresponding to the longest arrows of the PCAs, they are the litter biomass, the detrutivals abundance, and the fish biomass uh, of carnivorous and piscivorous. We have a look at the infralitoral photophilus reefs. We, we have one good and one very good uh, status, uh, respectively in the intermediate zone and the no-take zone. And um, the main uh, influencing the descriptors are from the fish assemblages as well, so the longest here, and with a gradient along the axis one here, from poor to a very good. And for the coral genus, we have only one good status, still in the no-take zone, and four poor status. And the, the influencing descriptors are more numerous. Uh, for example, the diversity of non calcareous macroalgae, the bio erodors, the grazers diversity, uh, the fish biomass of uh, omnivores and carnivores, and the specific richness uh, of fish assemblages. So to resume, uh, we are in a, an area with very specific um, uh, hydrology, with water turbidity higher than the, in the province of French Riviera, for example. And we, we find out that several descriptors show no pattern linked with the management, and we have something very homogeneous with intermediate or poor status, and particularly outside of the reserve. And the good and very good sites are found exclusively inside the reserve. And let's see some detailed results of, of some descriptors. So here are the, the fish assemblages biomass. And if we have a look on infralitoral and genus beds, we find a strong, uh, so it's quite obvious, a, a strong difference between the sites inside the reserve, the no-take zone or the intermediate zone uh, compared to the to outside the reserve. So the same pattern is observed for Posidonia oceanica meadow. So let's see now for the, the sea urchins in Posidonia oceanica meadow, so the density of Paracentrotus lividus. Um, we find a lower abundance within the reserve uh, with uh, strongly significant differences. Um, it could be a traffic cascade effect because we have a highest ab abundance of predators of sea urchins within the reserve, mainly sparrows. So it's quite an interesting result. But if we have a look at the sea urchin inside the infralitoral reefs, so Sparacentrotus and Arbacea lixula, we, we find a very different pattern. And we have two sites here in the intermediate zone that are characterized by barren grounds, so interesting coralinals, and the high density of uh, Arbacea lixula and Paracentrotus lividus, while the other, uh, the rest of the area is characterized by bushy seasonal macroalgae community. So to conclude, um, the, the feedback we, we had from the managers about the ecosystem-based approach is that it's a way uh, to better understand the functioning of our ecosystems, of our area. So it's not only just to new uh, indicators or no indicators are, are perfect, but the, the concept of the ecosystem-based approach is of interest for the managers. And our results uh, prove, uh, once again, the effectiveness of almost 50 years of conservation with what we saw in the marine reserve of Cerber Banyus. And this result from the UBQI can be of help in the current project of extension of the reserve of the no-take zone. So the trainings provide um, as well questioning about UBQIs, UBQIs. So it's time consuming. What about the feasibility of some descriptors? 
how can we assess the link with human pressure? So there are a lot of, uh, say, oh, of things to improve and upcoming adjustments are to propose and will be proposed in the frame of the MARA project to take into account uh, first the hydrological viability depending on the area and the feedback from users, of course. And um, here we, we are dealing only with, uh, with the, the southern part of the Gulf of Lyon, but um, the, the goal is to, to do a larger scale analysis. And uh, first in the frame of the MARA project at the scale of the French Mediterranean coast, but uh, obviously, uh, it, it should be very interesting to, to go out our border and, uh, and, and work with other, other data sets. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Patrick, for the interesting presentation. Is there any question from the audience over there? Thank you, Patrick. Uh, could you just say me if um, did you use uh, methods of uh, public by personic, or is it was it uh, an adapted method? Um, we, we used um, the method that is uh, the public. Uh, okay. The, so no from the articles from uh, personic from Thibault from. Uh, okay. No adaptation. Mm. And but you will use um, an adjustment for the depths of the middles because. Uh, in the, the method from Personic et al. Uh, 2014, uh, the depth uh, to assess the middles is 15 meters. So it's uh, relevant compared to the water frame directive index, for example. But in, the, in, the, in Occitanie, there is only one middle up to 15 meters within the reserve of Serbar Banuch. So uh, we decide to uh, adjust and to measure um, the descriptors at the more appropriate depths corresponding to the depths of the middle. And uh, could you yes precise uh, how many how much time does it take to to do the uh, Posidonia uh, ABQI and how many divers please? So in the in the paper it's about uh, two two dives at four uh, observers at 15 meters, so it's about 50, 60 minutes of diving. Um, the paper is from 2014, so it's already eight years ago. And now with more experience, we uh, a, a team with, uh, with the habit of, the, um, of the, this index can do the work at four in one dive. And uh, without training, we can need like a one dive at four and one dive at two, for example. So it can be reduced. And that's the issue about this, uh, this method. You, you know, it, it's a time consuming, it can be long, but it can be reduced and optimized uh, when you have the habit to apply it. Hi. How did you choose uh, the borders between the classes? Because some are, were similar to water framework directive, but other were uh, a little bit different. Did you use uh, any you speak, uh, uh, I, I, I uh, don't oh, sorry. Uh, how did you choose uh, the, the borders between classes? Because some of them were similar to water framework directive classes, but others were slightly different. Did you use any description of the I, I didn't choose myself the border between the, the class status. It was done in a, like a workshop with, uh, with uh, experts, with uh, of ecologists. Some are, are here uh, today. So it, wa it was de defined according to, the, to the, the threshold between the, the descriptors and the, the notation. So it's, it's not... Uh, Maybe you can ask to, to Charles-François Boudouret or to, to Gérard Pergeon, Christine as well, or others. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, they, they were slightly different from what a framework directive, because I saw that the bad situation 
was at 0.335, while in weather for milk is at 0.1. So my question was, how did you um, select? Did you use any reference condition to compare your data? This uh, was my. I, I, I don't. I don't know. I. Uh, I, I I don't do it. Uh, I don't participate to this uh, construction of the index. And uh, as I uh, as I told you, you can can ask to to Jean Francois Boudouresque. <laughs> Would you check the data collected by the managers? You say that you trained all the managers. Did you check it? Are they reliable according to yours? And or how many does it take to get the reliable data from them? Yes, of course, we, we keep contact with the managers during all the process. And uh, they, they had a lot of questioning about uh, the methods, the effort to put on the field. And we have to, to, uh, to, to give them a, a frame. <laughs> But uh, what was really interesting in, in this, uh, this experience is that the, the, uh, the managers were very uh, skilled and had a lot of knowledge, some, some as PhD in ecology, or, and were able to do, I don't know, visual census or monitoring of, uh, of uh, invertebrate community. So it, it was really interesting. And the check uh, was done during all the process and uh, to, to have a, a relevant and a robust enough uh, data. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Okay, they told me that we have Fabrice connected and now connected online. Are you there, Fabrice? Are you there? Can you hear us? No? Yes, he's online. Yes, can you hear us? Yes, yes, I hear you perfectly. Okay, Hello. welcome, Fabrice. So you are going presenting a work titled a Hierarchical Scale-Based Approach Referring the Ecological Quality of a Marine Ecosystem from its Spatial Composition and Configuration. Fabrice, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. Uh, for the rest, I will keep going in French because I mentioned that before. Hope that is okay for you also. I will share my I will share my screen. Okay. Is it okay? Okay, ça marche. Okay, merci. Donc, j'aimerais premièrement remercier tous les organisateurs de ce de ce symposium. Et c'est vraiment un, un honneur et un privilège pour moi d'avoir l'occasion de faire cette présentation aujourd'hui aujourd devant vous et de reparler d'un écosystème de la Méditerranée qui est vraiment très, qui me tient à cœur depuis que j'ai fini, depuis que j'ai terminé ma, ma thèse. Donc, le, le contexte de déclin de la Pardon? Can you go to the first screen of the informal presentation? I don't understand perfectly. Maybe someone in French can ask him. You are you asking for, for my presentation? For, for, the, for the first screen. Full screen. For the first screen. Okay. This, this one? Vous pouvez appuyer sur F5, s'il vous plaît? Appuyez sur quoi, pardon? F5, Elle a demandé pour le full screen. On ne voit pas la présentation en full screen. Ah, ok, 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 d'accord. Sorry. 
Okay. Now it's okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so, okay. Donc, euh, j'ai l'occasion vraiment, et c'est un honneur de présenter, de parler de la posidonie ce matin devant vous. Et le déclin de... Le, et j'aimerais préciser déjà d'ailleurs que j'ai eu à faire cette thèse euh, sous la supervision de, de Madame Sonia Kefi et de Julie Deter, ma directrice de thèse, qui m'a d'ailleurs... Euh, qui m'a d'ailleurs invité à, à participer à ce colloque, à ce colloque aujourd'hui. Et donc c'est c'est dans le contexte en fait du déclin de la de la biodiversité mondiale que s'est inscrite cette thèse qui avait pour but de voir l'impact que les pressions anthropiques et de l'environnement exercent sur les herbiers de Posidonie à l'échelle à l'échelle méditerranéenne. Alors, ce n'est plus un secret pour personne, mais on sait aujourd'hui d'après les différents rapports et les plus récents de l'IBES que 82% de la biomasse et grands mammifères sont menacés. Il y a un déclin de 47% des écosystèmes naturels et que 25% de la faune et de la flore étudiées sont aujourd'hui menacées d'extinction avec des causes directes, que ce soit à l'échelle terrestre et marine, qui sont dues à l'utilisation des terres, la surexploitation des ressources, le changement climatique et les invasions biologiques. Ceci dit, Alpern en 2019 montrait que pour les différents écosystèmes marins, il y a trois types d'écosystèmes qui sont les plus menacés et les plus impactés par l'activité humaine, que sont les récifs coralliens, premièrement, ensuite les mangroves et, troisièmement, les herbiers marins. Parmi les herbiers marins, nous avons l'herbier de Posidonia Oceanica, qui est, une herbier très qui est un écosystème très important en Méditerranée et qui, en plus d'être impacté fortement par l'activité humaine, est sujet à un autre facteur qui est le manque de données, en fait, aujourd'hui, sur la régression des herbiers, qui n'est pas connu dans toutes les régions. Mais les zones où les, pour lesquelles les données existent, on a montré, en gros, à 67 de régression des herbiers sur 218 sites où les données sont disponibles, et que 16 de ces sites-là, on a vu une régression, et sur 16 autres il y a une stabilité de l'herbier. C'était un des sujets, c'était une des questions et des astuces de recherche de ma thèse qui était de pallier au manque de données, en fait, sur les villes de Posidonie quant à sa régression le long du littoral méditerranéen le français et également la Corse comprise. Les villes de, de Posidonia Oceanica, Oceanica, pour sa localisation géographique, est endémique à la Méditerranée. Je reviendrai ici plus tard. Mais du fait de cette localisation, elle est fortement sujette à l'impact humain puisque la, le long du pourtour méditerranéen abrite quand même près de 1% de la population mondiale en termes de superficie, près de 460 millions d'habitants et les différents écosystèmes qui se retrouvent en Méditerranée sont fortement menacés par l'activité humaine. Est-ce que la posidonie, la posidonie est une angiosphère marine, comme on l'a dit, un herbier marin qui forme des tapis denses et continus qui s'étale le long du, du fond marin et qui peut s'étendre sur des kilomètres et des kilomètres. L'herbe de Posidonie est endémique à la Méditerranée, je le disais tantôt, puisqu'elle n'est retrouvée uniquement qu'en Méditerranée. Et une autre caractéristique importante de cette herbe est qu'elle est une espèce sentinelle, c'est-à-dire qu'elle permet de suivre sur la base de ces paramètres biologiques les différents changements qui affectent automatiquement l'environnement dans lequel elle s'est installée. L'herbe de Posidonie est considérée par certains et après trois ans à découvrir cette espèce, je pense vraiment que c'est une déesse de la Méditerranée également. D'autres la considèrent également comme le poumon vert de la Méditerranée. C'est dit l'importance de la Posidonia Oceanica parmi les espèces emblématiques dans le milieu marin. Il est à, il est, il est à juste donc de considérer cette espèce comme un habitat d'intérêt communautaire, comme le décrit d'ailleurs la directive cadre Habitat. Mais j'aimerais donner un autre aperçu des différents services écosystémiques dont est pourvoyeuse l'herbier de Posidonie. Alors, elle va fixer le littoral, elle va produire de l'oxygène. Certains estiment même que la, la quantité d'oxygène, de, de carbone qu'elle est capable de fixer serait supérieure à l'équivalent de plusieurs forêts tropicales. C'est un vrai puits à carbone l'herbier de Posidonie. On a évalué également à l'hectare les, les revenus économiques qui sont liés de façon directe ou indirecte à l'herbe à près de 560, 514 000 euros par hectare par an. C'est vraiment, vraiment très, très important comme, comme, comme écosystème méditerranéen. Et le déclin que connaît aujourd'hui les herbes de Posidonie est dû en partie à des facteurs environnementaux 
compte lesquels il est difficile de pallier, comme les vagues, les grandes tempêtes, mais nous avons également la montée de la température des eaux, des eaux en milieu marin, également la turbidité qui est un facteur qui n'est pas fortement libre. Et ainsi dit, pour les facteurs environnementaux, il y a quand même une part importante de la régression des herbiers de Posidonie qui est attribuée à l'impact humain, qu'il soit direct ou indirect. Donc, nous avons parlé des rejets urbains ici, des déchets industriels. Et un autre, une autre pression très importante qui endommage le colibri, c'est le mouillage. Le mouillage en une nuit peut dégrader des, de plusieurs mètres carrés d'herbier. Et pour ceux qui connaissent bien l'espèce de Posidonie, sa régénération n'est pas des plus rapides dans le règne végétal. Et à l'échelle humaine, certaines la considèrent comme irréversible parfois, tant il est difficile ou de façon naturelle que l'herbier se régénère d'elle-même. Donc, Marba et Al ont estimé à près de deux tiers de la régression des herbiers de Posidonie qui serait attribuée à l'activité humaine. C'est un chiffre aussi qui est très, très important. Nous avons voulu donc répondre de façon globale à la question de la conservation des écosystèmes marins et, des, et du maintien des services écosystèmes dont elles sont pourvoyeuses en nous focalisant plus sur l'impact que les activités humaines ont sur les herbiers de Posidonia ou Oceanica en Méditerranée française. J'ai passé mon temps à vous poser le contexte de l'étude pour vous montrer ce qu'on a eu à faire, mais j'aimerais ici mettre l'accent sur un axe de recherche que nous avons eu à conduire pendant cette thèse, qui est d'identifier de façon inférentielle et de façon hiérarchique, en fait, la qualité écologique d'un habitat marin à partir de sa composition et de sa configuration spatiale. Laissez-moi vous préciser de quoi il est question. On sait que l'herbe de Posidonie est un habitat d'intérêt communautaire, je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, prioritaire, et qu'elle est surtout une espèce sentinelle, une espèce clé dans le milieu marin. Ce qui veut dire qu'elle permet de surveiller en fait les différentes variations, que ce soit montée de température, niveau de turbidité et autres, sont répertoriées directement sur l'herbe de Posidonie. Donc, en suivant les paramètres de l'herbe, on peut identifier la, la qualité de l'herbe dans, le, dans lequel elle est, mais savoir en fait par cette qualité également la qualité des masses d'eau dans lesquelles on se situe. Donc, espèce bioindicatrice de la qualité du milieu marin. Ceci a fait que plusieurs programmes de recherche, plusieurs programmes de surveillance ont amené à développer plusieurs indicateurs, que je vais appeler aussi des indicateurs biotiques, sur les rues de Posidonie. Nous avons tantôt des indicateurs de prix, les indicateurs du BIPO et les indicateurs du EBQI, dont je ne mentionne pas forcément ici. Ces indicateurs permettent d'évaluer le stade de conservation de l'herbe de Posidonie dans le milieu dans lequel elle est et donc de savoir l'état de qualité des masses d'eau dans lesquelles elle est située également. Elle donne également une, un bon aperçu des différentes pressions qui sont exercées sur les herbiers dans le milieu dans lequel elle est. Ceci dit, on a aujourd'hui une pléthore d'indicateurs en fait, pour suivre les masses d'eau. On s'y perd un peu parfois et on a remarqué en ce qui concerne les vies de Posidonie qu'il pouvait y avoir une redondance en fait, dans, les, dans les indicateurs qui sont mesurés et qu'elle n'assurait pas forcément la continuité spatiale, c'est-à-dire que on va au niveau d'une station assez localisée prendre des mesures qu'on veut inférer à toute une masse d'eau et quand on sait ce qu'est une masse d'eau et laquelle qu'elle peut avoir, la question se pose de savoir est-ce que nous sommes en train de prédire justement ce qui se passe à une échelle plus grande alors que nous prenons des mesures à une échelle très limitée. Le temps d'effort et d'acquisition de ces données-là est aussi assez constant. Donc, il est important de réfléchir à d'autres outils, d'autres aspects, d'autres indicateurs pouvant mieux faire le travail et de façon assez simplifiée. C'est donc ceci qui nous a amené à nous poser la question de quel indicateur utiliser et à quelle échelle faut-il continuer avec le dépôt de prévoir ces indicateurs biotiques ou faut-il réfléchir autrement et améliorer d'autres indicateurs qu'on peut utiliser à d'autres échelles. Donc, en termes de variation spatiale, nous avons été amenés à considérer les indicateurs paysagers, les indicateurs biotiques, que j'ai définis plus tôt, BIPO, PRI, EBQI. Mais pour ce qui est des indicateurs BIPO que je ne vais plus présenter ici parce que je pense que le panel les connaît assez bien, je vais évoquer rapidement les indicateurs paysagers. Une approche paysagère consiste à, car, à, à caractériser avec différents quadrats de taille variable une surface continue et à les indicateurs numériques, comme l'indice de déclin, l'indice de, l'indice de déclin qui va avec la régression ou la surface des biais vivants ou morts dans une superficie donnée, l'indice de forme des patchs 
Donc, à part de la forme des parts dans un quadrat, on peut évaluer si le, sur ce quadrat, euh, le statut de conservation de l'air biais, l'indice de cohésion entre patchs qui va évaluer la cohésion entre les différents patchs discontinus au niveau d'un du, quadrat donné, l'indice de fragmentation. Donc, nous, on a calculé ces indicateurs à différentes échelles, six différentes échelles pour pouvoir voir les variations. Alors, on pourrait aller un peu plus loin, mais il y a d'autres questions euh, paysagères qui se posent, dans lesquelles je ne rentre pas dans les détails ici. Toutefois, avec Différentes analyses statistiques, on a voulu observer les liens. Je précise qu'on avait des données sur. I'm sorry, but you already out of time. Can you stop talking to the end? Maybe go to the results and conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Fabrice, you can hear me? Yes. You can go on with the results from the subconclusion remarks if you can. Oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you for that you are out of time. So just wait a little bit quickly, please. I could not hear you perfectly. I don't know why. Maybe the Maybe with the internet connection. Ah, sorry, okay. About the conclusion. So we found that. Alors, en conclusion, assez rapidement, on a trouvé que les indicateurs paysagers étaient des méthodes d'acquisition plus faciles et plus correctes, en fait, pour suivre rapidement l'état des herbes de Pozgoni à très grande échelle. Mais nous voulons garder, mais il est intéressant de garder une dimension biologique, en fait, dans, la, dans le suivi des herbiers. Donc, il est bien de garder les indicateurs biotiques qui, qui ne sont pas redondants sur les sites prioritaires pour avoir une information biologique. Donc, voilà un peu la conclusion. So, thank you, Fabrice. Thank you. Any question? We have time just for one question, maybe. Okay, we can go on. Thank you, Fabius, once again. Thank you. So, the next presenter is Alicia Bandi. She's going to present a work titled Indices from the Past. Relevance in the status assessment of Pisidonia Chantamidos. And each the floor is yours. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Okay. Uh, in this session, it has already been underlined that all data are important to understand the present situation of marine ecosystems. So today, I'm going to present the results of a comparison study about the status assessment of Presidential Chanica Meadows by using different indices. Over the last decades, the need of assessing the status of the natural environment has become a, pri a primary concern. Biotic indices are measure tools recommended by European partners for assessing the ecological status of marine coastal ecosystems. 
since 2000 with the water framework directive and then the marine strategy framework directive, a large number of biotic ecosystems were developed based on sensitive target organisms or habitats, such as the Posidonian Chanica meadows. Okay, as before, there um, was no measurement of ecological status or use. Uh, a no use of biotic indices, the aim of this work was to assess the change over time of Posidonia oceanica habitats by applying nine different indices and descriptors to historical data and compare their outputs through a graphical approach. The overall objective is to compare historical data with reference in particular, we compare data from meadows of the Georgi, Montefusso, and Rome in the Regional Sea from 1992, 2003, and 1994. We compare this data with simply collected data, of course. So the field activities to collect data in recent times took place at the same location as the historical data. Data concerning the Posidonia coverage and any other substitutes like uh, uh, Cimodociano de Rosa or Caularpa algae. Uh, depth and type of lower limits, uh, shoot density were collected along underwater transect. And in addition, uh, around 18 leaf shoots were collected at the depth of 50 meters uh, for following laboratory analysis. So in total, we obtained nine descriptors and indices concerning different levels of ecological complexity, from individual to seascape. And these indices are commonly adopted in the monitoring of Posidonia oceanica meadows. Uh, so as you can see, uh, these indices were uh, for at individual level, the leaf surface, at population level, the lower limit depth, the person cover at lower limits, the shoot density. At community level, the epiphyte biomass. At seascape level, uh, the seascape indices, so conservation index, substitution index, and phase, phase shift index. And as multi level, we consider the prey index. However, the problem when using several indices to assess the habitat status is that it is difficult to obtain a single comprehensive measure as the indicator used often have different response times and refer to different ecosystem components. So for this reason, we use a new graphical approach named the rescue, uh, which allows the comparison of different indices by returning a unique measure of habitat quality. Data were rescaled to have comparable values uh, in the range between zero and one, and graphically depicted on radar charts. So we set the data in a way that the closer the index value to one, the higher the environmental quality, Thus, the data area of the resulting polygon was considered as a measure of the overall environmental quality. While uh, consistency between indices was expressed by circularity of the polygon perimeter. The circularity is the ratio between the area of a polygon and the area of a circle having equal circumference to the polygon perimeter. And the uh, circularity ranges from one, that is a perfect uh, circle, as you can see in image, to zero. And so as the value approaches zero, it indicates an increasingly, uh, increasingly irregular polygon. So to, uh, due to the different responding times of indices to stress and disturbances, consistency among indices through the circularity can be interpreted as a measure of meadow resilience. So <clears throat> by looking at the results, you can see uh, in the figure uh, an increase in the polygon area over time for all the three meadows. While as regards the polygon shape, it remains quite irregular. In particular, the improvement is higher in Prelo, 
with 47%. Then Bergeggi uh, show an improvement of 35% of the area and Monterosso an improvement of 28%. The circularity, the circularity values are generally low, as you can see uh, down here in the slide, um, for all the meadows uh, except for Monterosso. The only meadow that shows a decrease in circularity was Bergeggi with uh, less than 6%. But uh, anyway, in, a, in all cases, uh, changes over time uh, do not exceed the 10%. Okay. Uh, overall, all the meadows show an improvement over time, as it has already been reported for the Ligurian Sea and the other European coasts, where since the 2000s, the decreasing trend of Posidonia Oceanica meadows seems to be stopped or slowed down. In particular, Monterosso, Monterosso uh, results the best preserved meadow, probably thanks to the fact that this included in a marine protected area since 1997, the marine protected area of Cinque Terre, that is also the uh, oldest marine protected area in Liguria. Uh, the recovery, um, of course, the recovery of Posidonia Oceanica meadows is one of the positive consequences of appropriate management interventions like the establishment of marine protected area, as shown by the two graphs you can see here. And in the end, uh, the lower quality of Bergeggi and Prelo is likely due to the phase shift that both the meadows experienced because of the replacement by substitute species. Uh, on the left, you can see the meadows of Bergeggi that was replaced by Cimodociano Dosa and then Caulerpa Sigindraccia, uh, while on the right, uh, uh, you can see Prelo uh, that was replaced by Caulerpa prolifera in the past. So concluding, the results of this study confirmed that due to the complexity of seagrass habitats, the use of several indices is needed in the habitat quality assessment and the rescue graphical approach provide an effective and easy way to compare and interpret uh, different indices outcomes and its potential is even more appreciated in the diachronical studies. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Alice, for this uh, speech, uh, for the perfect timing. Any question from the audience? Um, have you seen if uh, one of several indices were most, more variable than others? Can you repeat the question? Please? Have you seen if uh, one or several uh, of your indices were more variable than others? Uh, yes. Um, can I put again the... Yeah. You show it, but uh, it was a bit uh, quick. <laughs> okay. Uh, too much. <laughs> Sorry. No. Okay. Okay. Um, well, um, the most um, variable uh, was uh, the uh, the indices of uh, at individual level. So the uh, leaf surface, and then the uh, lower, um, no, only the leaf surface, sorry, at the individual level, individual and population level. So leaf surface, lower limit depth, and lower limit cover, uh, because in the Ligurian Sea, uh, 
the lower limit especially uh, is uh, quite shallow and uh, we have a high pressure from um, we have a high anthropogenic pressure so uh, the limit uh, of course uh, suffer from this pressure and so we have very different uh, uh, value uh, of cover and of uh, uh, depth. That's all. Okay, so thank you, Alicia, once again. So the next presenter will be Marie Larivière. She's expected to be connected online. Are you Hello. there, Marie? Yes, she's there with us. So welcome. You are going to present a work titled Bentic Habitat ID and Policy Cross Links to Improve Marine Conservation. So Marie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Because I cannot see anything now. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. I need to try this again. What about now? Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. Um, so, hello everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't join you in person, but I'm very glad to do this via modern communication tool. Um, I will present you a work that was led by the uh, Natural Heritage Unit, which is a, a mutual unit from the French Biodiversity Agency, the National Museum of Natural History and the CNRS, and uh, with uh, funding from the Life Integrated Project MARA. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the, um, the, those are actually two projects uh, in the same context uh, with the many habitats list and classification system uh, from different um, convention uh, directives, but uh, none of those provided us a comprehensive uh, list of habitats to do national inventory. So we needed um, special lists um, and uh, to be able to ID everything that we have on the field. So this was a work that was presented, I think, two symposium ago by uh, my former colleague, Noemi Michez, uh, about the national classification uh, that France built for Mediterranean habitats that was published in 2011 and then updated in 2014. So I'm not gonna expand on this. Uh, it, everything is um, available online on the INPN website. Uh, you can flash the code or you have the reference link in the proceedings. Um, but we had this uh, very detailed classification of habitats units, but we only had the name. And if you're not an expert, some of the habitats name are not very clear and um, you don't really know what's inside or some of the names really look alike. And uh, we needed a description of each unit to ensure appropriate identification for non-experts. So that is something that we started in 2016. There was a first phase uh, with um, several habitats described back then. And then uh, we had to pass this project for various reasons. And we started again in 2020 and published um, everything in 2021. So what we did is that we based um, the description of each unit on existing information. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So based on uh, Barcelona Convention, Habitat List Description, uh, the works from uh, Perez and Pica, Belon Santini and colleagues, Ben Zetichi and colleagues, <clears throat> and so on. And uh, we ended up with a 151 um, description card, all published in a PDF catalog that is a really thick uh, catalog, and it's also available online through the National Repository Habref. So each Habitats unit has his um, um, web page and all information related to this unit is available. Um, for now, uh, those 
um, those descriptions are only in French, uh, but I think the, the translation of not so difficult to make in English. And uh, hopefully that, that could help other Mediterranean countries to better identify uh, similar habitats unit that they can have in their waters. So to show you what a description look like, looks like, um, this is an extract of the uh, biocenosis, one of the subhabitats of the biocenosis of muddy sand uh, in sheltered waters. Um, so all description cards have the, the same look. Uh, you can find the, the code and name of the habitat. I'm not gonna read it because it's pretty long. Um, a link to the web page, um, then um, a reminder of the hierarchical classification and then the description itself. Uh, where we try to specify abiotic factors, distinctive features, variability, char characteristics and associated species, uh, risks of habitat confusion. Uh, this is um, um, to avoid uh, confusion with other habitats of the same classification when sometimes you have the same uh, species but not in the same uh, substratum, for example, or not the same uh, depth zone. Also natural dynamics, geographical distribution. Geographical distribution only, uh, is only specified for French waters. And then another section on conservation interest, threats, trends. So obviously this reflects uh, threats and trends when the description was made. So around 2020, uh, it probably will evolve. And uh, then references that were used to the description and uh, authors and date of description to ensure proper citation of the work. Um, when uh, we, we did this work of description, so then, then uh, all French national classification habitats units had their ID cards, uh, but then um, MPA managers, uh, most uh, specifically Natural 2000 site managers said, Okay, good. Now we know that what what we have on the field, but we still struggle with uh, the the habitats unit that we need to manage under the habitat directive framework, and that is because, uh, as you may know, habitat directive um, defines HIC habitats of conservation interests, um, nine, nine types of HIC HCI, sorry, but uh, their definition definitions are really broad. So the, this is the list of the habitats units that uh, should be considered under the habitat directive. And you can see like reefs that basically mean anything that has a rocky bottom. This is not really um, useful for our management list under a definition that uh, is suitable to manage. Um, the European Commission provides uh, an interpretation manual with some definitions, but they are still not really um, uh, sometimes too vague. It's not, it's not precise enough. So we try to provide a national interpretation. We gathered with uh, different um, Natura 2000 site managers uh, from the terrestrial part and from the marine part. And uh, we said, okay, we are going to precise uh, the, the EU definition, and this is gonna be the French national interpretation. So we, with the same template, we try to describe um, uh, each uh, HCI, so the, the ninth uh, marine HCI. And uh, with a, after the remainder of the European definition, we define the, the HIC according to the French interpretation and uh, precise identification criteria. For example, this is the, 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 the interpretation for the sandbanks in uh, sheltered waters. What does um, that, no, it's sandbanks that are slightly covered um, all, all the time. So what does sandbanks mean? What does uh, slightly covered means uh, the, we needed to precise this in order for the site managers to be able to work with those units that they have to report on. Um, so that's what we try to do. And at least it, it, it's not perfect, but it's there. And now they can all work with the same definition of the, of the habitats unit. 
Um, so we provided its definition and then we added some details uh, like possible overlays with other HCI, uh, national specificities, distinctive criteria and delimitation of the units. We, we tried to write why we decided what we decide, <laughs> why and how. Uh, for example, for the HIC estuaries, we had to define where does the estuary starts, where, where it's, um, it ends, where is the river, where is the open sea. And so we wanted to put all this on paper. Um, so for now it's in French, but we plan to uh, translate it in English uh, by the end of the year. So hopefully uh, it would help also other EU members. We really relied on the UK and Spain work. Uh, they, they conducted a similar work, national interpretation. So hopefully um, this one would help other countries. And uh, also in each card, you can find um, different pictures of the variability of GHCI, everything. We, we tried to illustrate all the type of uh, habitats you can find under this broad unit. And then we made crosswalks um, between those uh, two projects. So to identify which habitats from the national classification should be considered or could be considered as a HIC and under uh, which conditions. So this leads to a big table, uh, 550 co correlations. We did it uh, for the Mediterranean, it's gonna be online and um, it will surely improve the consistency in Natura 2000 sites management, management and hopefully improve reporting at the biogeographical scale. And now the to end the, the work that is ongoing, we are conducting the similar work uh, for the Atlantic part of the French uh, coast. And uh, we are building correlation tables uh, between the, the new version of the UNIS classification system with our national classification, but also with the French interpretation of HCI and also HCI with Barcelona Convention list. So hopefully it could, uh, it could help other countries um, to identify and better manage their habitats units. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, for your very interesting presentation. Is there any question from the audience? Otherwise I can add something as well. No questions? Yes, Atef, please. <laughs> okay, uh, just uh, as uh, Marie uh, as mentioning that there uh, should be some uh, uh, correlation between the uh, national list of habitat and also the uh, Barcelona Convention. Uh, as you know, in the framework of the Barcelona Convention 2018, we adopted the new updated list of, ref of reference of marine habitat type. And we are uh, finalizing now the edition of the manual of interpretation that should be soon available. So we, we had to be in contact to see how we could uh, uh, progress on that uh, direction. Thank you. Thank you, Ajay. Any other questions? Okay, so we can move to the last uh, one uh, speech of the morning of this morning session. It will be online, and we should have uh, Onur Karayali connected online. Onur, are you Hello. there? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you so and much. And welcome. Thank you. We are going to present a work titled The Need of Reference Conditions for Comparable Monitoring of Posidonia Oceanica at Ecoregional Scale, including the Sliding Baseline Syndrome, a discussion over FOCA SEPA. Honor, the floor is yours. Yes, it's right. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Okay. 
First of all, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, it's really important for us uh, to share our ideas and our words. Uh, I'd like to be there, but uh, because of some bureaucratic issues, I couldn't be, but uh, thanks to new technologies, I'm gonna share my presentation with you now. So let's start. Uh, okay. I'm gonna talk about a uh, story, story of Focha uh, and the other ideas and suggestions with you. Focha is a little town in the Aegean Sea. Uh, it is located in the Gulf of Izmir, the northern part uh, of the Gulf of Izmir. And in uh, 1990, uh, Turkey government uh, decided to declare Focha as SEPA, uh, with this borderline uh, 32 years ago. Can you see here? You can see here. Then uh, 15 years later, uh, they started to, uh, they started to uh, study on uh, mapping Posidonia Oceanica by satellite imagery and a drop-down camera. But because of the problems, uh, technical problems of drop-down camera, uh, they, had really a good, uh, good enough uh, border lines of the upper limits. But as I said, because of the drop down camera techniques, uh, they couldn't have enough, uh, good enough uh, border lines of lower limits. Then uh, two years later, uh, Turkey government uh, decided to enlarge the SEPA uh, from 27.58 kilometers square to 71.38 kilometers square. And also marine area uh, was enlarged from 15.12 kilometers square to 50.45 kilometers square. It was really important for us. And then uh, in uh, 2019, I also involved this study uh, we use satellite imagery again, and then uh, also we use a side scan sonar measurement. And side scan sonar, with, uh, side scan sonar we had really good enough lower limits also, but uh, we could compare just upper limits because of the old data. And also uh, we set four different monitoring stations, uh, two lower limits and uh, two upper limits. You can see uh, here uh, at the black points. But uh, we saw that there was an obvious regression. Uh, we didn't expect this kind of uh, regression because uh, Focha has been protected for many years. And I would like to show you uh, three different locations here in Focha. Uh, these locations are used uh, by human activities really strongly. And uh, first, uh, okay, for example, in location one, uh, this place is uh, used by recreational uh, activities. And as you can see here, uh, these profiles, uh, in these profiles, uh, some patches was complete some patches were completely disappeared and the meadow uh, was really regressed. And location two, uh, in 2005, uh, this place can be told the pristine area, but then uh, they decided to build coastal structures here. Then uh, to build these coastal structures, they had to fill uh, the sea here. And as you can imagine, uh, all the meadows are gone. Uh, and you can see here in this profile one and profile two, uh, all these meadows and patches uh, completely lost. And in location three, uh, okay, this place uh, is used, is being used uh, by commercial and uh, recreational boat ships and personal ships because it's close to Northern Wind and uh, because of the anchorage effect, uh, some patches was complete, were completely disappeared and meadow, uh, were, meadows were really regressed here too. And uh, in 2000, 
2005 and 2008, they uh, applied ecological indices uh, to classify the ecological status. And we wanted to do it, but uh, we need reference conditions here to do uh, this job. But um, when we look at the reference conditions, all the reference conditions are set in the uh, Western Mediterranean. So we had some uh, doubts because of the possible uh, physical chemical difference uh, to use these reference conditions. We decided to set our reference conditions, but uh, how uh, should we decide the locations of these uh, reference conditions? So, <coughs> so uh, the also also uh, we had to be so quick because uh, also there is a sliding baseline syndrome and all the reference conditions were sliding and regressing in the meantime. And uh, we thought, how can we solve this problem? Uh, and uh, also, I would like to mention that uh, I'm planning to uh, study on this topic uh, in my PhD thesis. I, I want to uh, set Turkey reference conditions, but also uh, all the Mediterranean um, can need these kind of uh, work because we need a very uh, good databases and reliable comparable databases as we uh, do in Turkey. To solve this problem, it's not very new term, but uh, we remember the coastal ecoregions. Uh, this map is an example. Uh, now we have uh, enough technology to uh, set uh, and characterize our uh, coastals uh, to, um, <clears throat> to uh, uh, to set our coastal ecoregions, uh, we can uh, compare uh, surface circulation in the Mediterranean Sea because we have this data and we can maybe compare uh, all the biodiversity data and also maybe some more uh, to set these ecoregions uh, because if we can do it, uh, we will have comparable reference conditions and sorry, comparable data uh, and uh, reliable data, monitoring data, uh, thanks to our uh, reference conditions set uh, by our, uh, by our uh, physical chemical parameters, actually. And we decided to suggest our idea in this platform because you know that all of scientists are here and uh, all the decision makers are here. And so uh, we are just uh, suggesting now uh, this idea to set uh, all, the, uh, all the coastal ecoregions in the Mediterranean to have, as I said, comparable and reliable uh, monitoring. Thank you for your attention and for your time. Thank you, Honor, for uh, your interesting speech and the perfect timing. I think that uh, it is really important, this uh, issue to define, clearly define the reference condition because uh, uh, the reference condition can affect, uh, uh, an incorrect choice of the reference condition can affect all the uh, results and the outputs. So any questions from the audience? Yes, there. Thank you for this uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, just a curiosity, um, what kind of the satellite uh, imagery data you used? Multispectral or three-band uh, imagery to, to do the first uh, mapping? I'm sorry, I couldn't understand you because of the voices, background. Could you repeat your question? I'm trying to repeat, yeah. Uh, what kind of imagery you used for this mapping? You used a multispectral imagery or three sing single band, three band uh, imagery from satellites? Yes, as you said, we used uh, multispectral imagery uh, in our uh, study.
but the other studies actually uh, there are references here uh, because they are really uh, old studies uh, 2005 and 2008 uh, I can share all the papers and project outcomes with you thank you very much thank you too any other question? So I think that we can conclude this morning session. I don't know if we still have, uh, yes, if we still have some time to a uh, little bit discussion of the overall session on uh, mapping. I think that most of the of the presentation uh, clearly underlined the regressive or declining status of most of our middles. We are well aware about this situation, but we also um, saw some uh, good signs of recovery in some locally, at least in some middles. So this could be a good uh, a good results. And also, I think that all the um, technology that can be still developed from now on can be useful to set uh, uh, information, to set the references uh, and to tackle over time the, the change of Seagrass Meadows. I maybe see some question from the audience there. Merci. Euh, D'abord, je voudrais remercier tous les intervenants de ce matin pour les présentations très intéressantes sur la cartographie de la végétation marine. Juste une remarque, la plupart de ces présentations étaient sur le, la rive nord de la Méditerranée. Donc, il y a un écart entre nord et sud qui euh, n'a pas été encore corrigé. Euh, tout à l'heure, M. Perjean a parlé de la Tunisie qui euh, présente euh, une, donc la, 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 plus, la surface la plus importante euh, de Posidonie, en Tunisie par exemple, et jusqu'à aujourd'hui, on n'a aucune carte euh, complète de la végétation marine au niveau de la Tunisie. Euh, pour les travaux, c'est toujours quelque chose qui manque, et j'aimerais attirer l'attention du SPARAC pour mettre en priorité la cartographie de la végétation marine au niveau de la rive sud. Parce que c'est très important. On a vu tout à l'heure qu'on utilisait des données anciennes pour voir la régression ou la progression de ces herbiers. Et ça, ça manque. Voilà. Merci. Yes, you are totally right, for sure. But uh, I may also add that uh, also in Italy, we just have a few examples of a fully mapped uh, coastline. So it's a wide uh, issue for everybody. But of course, maybe we can keep in mind that it could be a take home message to try to improve the mapping effort also in the southernmost area of the Mediterranean Sea, for sure. Okay. Oh. Just to reply to uh, this problem, I mean, SPARAC and uh, the framework of Barcelona Convention, since now uh, four years, we are aware about uh, the problem to, uh, to make available all the uh, mapping uh, exercises concerning not only Posidonia, but also other uh, habitats that uh, are concerned by uh, regional uh, conservation strategy. And during this biennium, we launched already uh, a big um, uh, effort to collect all the data and we are in contact also with the country in order to uh, have their feedback and uh, uh, consensus on the collected data. And I hope that we will have, a, let's say, a, um, a zero uh, um, a reference uh, maps for uh, Posidonia that will show uh, the gaps 
but also uh, to help us to concentrate our effort uh, during the next year to uh, in terms of uh, cartography and uh, mapping of Posidonia, but also the other habitat. And hope uh, uh, during um, before the end of the year, we will uh, diffuse those uh, regional maps of distribution. Okay. It's still always a, a priority for uh, for the region that uh, uh, Sparak is working on, and also you know you you know that this also need a lot of financial resources that also we are uh, trying to look in for. Thank you. We have a question from home, Thomas. Please. Yes, thank you. Just a quick reaction. You said before that we had. Uh majority of presentation about uh, regression of the meadows and uh, just a few about uh, recovery. And uh, I so I wanted to take this opportunity to mention that we, um, in, the, in, the, in the French Mediterranean, we had the, the good surprise to be able to map uh, with size scan sonar, sonar some, uh, some sites of uh, recovery with the shape of uh, atoll. Uh, on the on the French coast, uh, and we are currently trying to work out the the reasons of this recovery. The hypothesis were the the better uh, treatment of wastewater for in the last uh, 10, 20 years. Uh, statistically, for the moment, it's not that clear. Maybe it's more due to environmental conditions, but we are working on it. And uh, it was an idea to present this at this symposium, but it's still uh, work. The work is still beginning, so maybe next next time. Thank you. Thank you. Any, uh, any thank other you. question? There? Yes, I have a question about the hydrological conditions about Posidonia. I'm questioned that now we we have different indicators for environment and the biology and the importance of the habitats. But from what I heard from Patrick, you still have to, to, to integrate the hydrological conditions to define the things. And um, with the last presentation about the different uh, landscape of um, how to call that hydrological landscapes, my question is just, I wonder, is it possible to define the physical resilience of Posidonia depending on regions? It's more a question for scientists, actually, to know if uh, in the future, I mean, it's a huge question. As we know, coastal management and coastal structures is a huge issue as an indirect impact to destroy Posidonia. How do we basically set up the reference conditions of the physical resilience of Posidonia when we know we have a project that would be built like 100 meters from the uh, dead mat? Am I clear? <laughs> You mean the physical res uh, resilience according to uh, physical uh, factors, uh, impacts, something like this? How can we uh, evaluate or define the physical resilience? For, for, I take an example. For instance, uh, I'm working for the French bio, French biodiversity agency. <laughs> I need a coffee. Um, and before, my job was to to know how to evaluate the impact of Posidonia on coastal structures. And now what people say, we don't want, uh, we ha you have to build at a specific distance from Posidonia to be sure you are not going to impact it. But that, mean, that means what you want is that the physical hydrological conditions close to Posidonia are not going to change. But this thing, what I heard from this morning, is changing depending on the situation in the regions. So maybe it's possible to go further in the future to be able to define, instead of saying you have to go at 100 meters, 50 meters, 10 meters from the, the Ramos guidelines, maybe able to say what we need to define is here is the physical condition of my Posidonia. And this thing so far, I didn't really see it in publications. But, and from this thing to be able to define a threshold, quantitative threshold, say, okay, what I need is just to, to, to find these thresholds for consultancy companies to use their model to say, I'm going to build it and I'm not going to destroy Pusdona. Yes. Okay. It's clear. I don't know if Patrick would like to add something about uh, 
setting some references for hydrological condition. Uh, if, you, maybe, if you have maybe, some suggestions, I don't know. Maybe I have a comment about the, the recovery of Posidonia. So the, the first rule that everyone knows is that when you reduce or delete the pressure, so there is a resilience and the Posidonia can recover. Uh, and so there are a lot of examples already described in the literature when you uh, diverted the sewage elsewhere in, in a bay, for example, and you, you put the sewage elsewhere, you have well, improved the treatment, you have a recovery. So we observe this in the Bay of Marseille. So maybe I have a question for Thomas. The recovery they observed, uh, is it at the lower or the upper limit of the middle? Uh, yes, uh, I'm just trying to remember. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, I'm trying to remember, but I think uh, we are at the lower limits. We are at the lower limit. And uh, what, what is interesting is it's many sites. Uh, and uh, it is uh, it really has a at all circular shape. And uh, yes, the, the first hypothesis was that it was close to, to outflow of, uh, of um, sewage of bad water, but not treated, but uh, we, yes, we're working on it now. It's very interesting because we have example of, uh, I'm thinking about the Porcro National Park, uh, protected since uh, more than 60 years, almost 60 years of, of conservation without trolling, without uh, any sewage or turbidity input from the, the continent. And we observe since the last 20 years uh, uh, a withdrawal or a regression of the middle. And that could be explained by, I don't, it's a combination, it's, it's not uh, easy to interpret, but by uh, the sea level rise or the, the spreading of uh, Kaolerpa, uh, I don't know, or other. So it, it's really interesting to have a, a contrasted result and the opposite. So I will follow this. Yes, we can uh, keep in touch on this. Uh, we'll be happy. Sure. OK, another question, please, Gerard. Yes, I will uh, point out two things. First point concerning Thomas uh, intervention. Effectively, Mediterranean physical environment is changing. Of course, everybody speak about the temperature, but also the sea level rise is uh, increasing. And for the Posidonia, the deeper Posidonia meadow, we have a problem of light. Actually, in nearly all the sites where you have no human impact or very scarce human impact, you have a regression of the lower limit in relation with the slope, in relation with the diminution of light on the bottom. It's general, the first point. The second point concerning the map in all the Mediterranean basin. Uh, today we have seen very nice system, very nice technique of mapping, very precise one. Yes, it's fantastic. But we need also a general mapping in some region. It's what said uh, ATEF. We need data for region and we have not uh, size scan so now, we have not uh, all the possibility. You, recently, uh, Traganos and colleagues have made um, a general evaluation of the, the seagrass in all the Midian Sea, but we need national studies based on simple uh, method, uh, based on Google uh, Earth, based on transect, based on diving, to have an idea of uh, this map. And to finish, we need also the very precise map to see the regression and the evolution of the meadow. For me, it's impossible to say like some people, some author, the regression of 20, 30% uh, of the last century in the Mediterranean Sea. We have not the baseline. How we can see that we have a regression if we don't know the exact position 20 or 30 years before? Then we, we need the both a general overview of the Posidonia, of course, and also some reference site to follow 
the evolution of the regression and uh, in the uh, changing Mediterranean uh, Sea. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard. I think that uh, we are now at the end of this morning session. I would like to uh, acknowledge all the presenters that uh, are here in, uh, in the room, as well as all the presenters that are uh, following the symposium from home. So thank you to everybody. Uh, Atef, would you like to give some details for uh, yes. the afternoon? So we concluded the first uh, session of this symposium. So we break for the lunch and uh, we have to come back uh, sharp at uh, 2.30 because we had uh, uh, the next poster session, um, next uh, session with two uh, uh, long session, but also we have the poster uh, presentation uh, during the afternoon. So we should uh, resume at 2.30 sharp in order to uh, to complete the the afternoon okay thank you very much and we we see you back